سعادة وزير البيئة والتغير المناخي الشيخ الدكتور فالح بن ناصر الثاني سعادة الدكتور رئيس جامعة قطر حسن بن راشد الدرهم سعادة نائب رئيس جامعة قطر للبحث والدراسات العليا الأستاذة الدكتورة مريم العلي المعاضيد الحضور الموجود من داخل دولة قطر وخارجها السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته محدثتكم لبابا يوسف أنا خريجة جامعة قطر وأتشرف وأسعد بأن أكون برفقتكم عريفا لهذا المؤتمر اليوم إذا على مساحة 1181 كم مربع من الصحراء الجافة وبساحل طوله 563 كم تتلاطمه أمواج مياه الخليج العربي تحوي دولتنا الحبيبة قطر على كنز فريد من المناطق والظواهر البيئية المختلفة من منجروف إلى شعاب مرجانية وحتى السبخات والسبخة كما أعتقد أن أغلبنا يعرفها بما أننا متواجدون هنا هي أرض مستوية عادة ما تقع بين صحراء ومحيط وتوجد بكثرة هنا في دولة قطر وعليه يستعرض هذا المؤتمر بالتفصيل حول هذه الظاهرة الطبيعية في قطر ولهذا أرحب بكم جميعا رسميا في افتتاح المؤتمر الدولي حول السبخات في قطر ودعونا فضلا نبدأ هذا المؤتمر وهذا اللقاء بسرورنا لدعوة سعادة الدكتور حسن بن راشد الدرهم مدير جامعة قطر ليتفضل بإلقاء كلمته مشكورا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السيدات والسادة الحضور إنه من دواعي سروري أن أرحب بهم بكم هذه النخبة المميزة من العلماء القادمين من مختلف أنحاء العالم ممن كرسوا جزءا من حياتهم وجهودهم في البحث العلمي لدراسة هذه المنطقة والتعرف عليها وهي رسالة تكمل ما أنجزناها تكمل ما أنجزناه قبل أسابيع فقط حين جمعت قطر بشرة من كل أركان المعمورة موحدين في المشاعر والأفكار تجاه هدف النبيل فكانوا مثلما أنتم اليوم ضيوفا كراما مرحبا بكم في دولة قطر في رسالة واضحة هدفها المحبة والسلام وجمع الناس على ما ينفع الناس ومثلما جمعت كرة القدم تلك الحشود فلقد اجتذبت سباخ قطر ومنذ ستينيات القرن الماضي فرقا بحثية من العلماء من مختلف جامعات العالم وشركات النفط العالمية وكما تعرفون فإن بداية البحوث المتعلقة بسباخ قطر والتي قام بها باحثون من شركة شيل ودائرة المساحة الجيولوجية الأمريكية وجامعة لندن قد مثلت في وقتها فتحا جديدا في فهم الماضي الجيولوجي للمنطقة وتفسير طريقة تراكم النفط والغاز في بعض المكامن النفطية التي تشابه السباخ في مكوناتها الصخرية والمعدنية فأثارت تلك البحوث انتباه باحثين من أمثالكم وأصبحت هذه المنطقة تدرس في معظم جامعات العالم باعتبارها نموذجا حديثا للمكامن النفطية والغازية التي تكونت في العصور الجيولوجية الغابرة إلى حد أن كلمة السبخة العربية قد دخلت اللغة الإنجليزية في قاموس اكسفورد وفي بقية لغات العالم الحية ولقد ازدادت أهمية السباخ بعد البحوث الحديثة التي أشارت إلى وجود تشابه محتمل بين بيئة السباخ والتاريخ الجيولوجي المبكر لكوكب المريخ تمثل السباخ جزءا من التراث البيئي الطبيعي في دول مجلس التعاون الخليجي ومن بينها دولة قطر وكانت في الماضي مصدرا أساسيا لاستخراج الملح الذي كان مادة ثمينة يتم تسويقه بين دول المنطقة مقابل مواد غذائية أخرى مثل التمر وفي حين تم تدمير كثير من بيئات السباخ في منطقة الخليج العربي وبقية بلدان العالم بسبب التطورات العمرانية فيها إلا أن دولة قطر وكجزء من التزامها المستمر بالتنمية المستدامة اهتمت كثيرا بالمحافظة على هذه البيئات الفريدة ولعلها الآن أفضل هذه المناطق من أي مكان آخر في العالم 
وتحولت بعض مناطقها مثل خور العديد إلى محمية طبيعية ومتنزها جيولوجيا على قائمة الأمم المتحدة وكذلك باعتبارها إرثا بيئيا فريدا في القائمة المبدئية للأمم المتحدة ونأمل أن يساعد مؤتمركم هذا في دعم الجهود الإقليمية والعالمية إلى لفت انتباه الحكومات والمنظمات العالمية لتوفير حماية أفضل لهذه البيئات المهمة السادة الحضور تلتزم جامعة قطر بتشجيع البحوث المتعلقة بمختلف مكونات النظام البيئي الطبيعي لدول لدولة قطر وللمنطقة وتدفع باتجاه إيصال نتائج هذه البحوث إلى طلبتها في مختلف مراحل الدرا... مراحلهم الدراسية من خلال التدريس المدعم بالبحوث وتعطي أولوية في توفير الدعم المعنوي والمالي لأعضاء هيئة التدريس والباحثين ممن يعملون ضمن هذه الأولويات البحثية كما نصت عليها الوثائق الأساسية لدولة قطر بما فيها رؤية قطر الوطنية 2030 واستراتيجية جامعة قطر وكذلك أولويات البحث العلمي التي حددتها الجامعة وتأتي دراسة السباخ ضمن هذه الأولويات ويعكس تنظيم مؤتمر متخصص في هذا المجال انعكاسا لالتزامنا المستمر بهذه الثوابت خدمة لبلدنا وللبحث العلمي بشكل عام أود أن أتقدم بالشكر الجزيل لمؤسسة قطر التي قدمت من خلال الصندوق القطري لرعاية البحث العلمي تمويلا متواصلا لعدد من المشاريع المتعلقة بدراسة الجوانب المختلفة لبيئات السباخ خلال السنوات الماضية كما قامت مشكورة بتوفير الدعم الجزئي لتنظيم هذا المؤتمر وكذلك إلى شركائنا الآخرين وبشكل خاص شركة أكسوم موبل قطر التي تعمل على نحو مستمر معنا في دعم البحث العلمي البحث العلمي والعملية التدريسية في الجامعة وكذلك أود أن أشكر الخطوط الجوية القطرية لدعمها لهذا المؤتمر أشكركم جميعا على حضور فعاليات هذا المؤتمر وخصوصا أولئك الذين قدموا من أماكن بعيدة وأتمنى لكم إقامة طيبة بيننا ولمؤتمركم النجاح والتوصل إلى نتائج توفر فهما أفضل لهذه البيئات المهمة ولكم شخصيا التقدم والازدهار ومرحبا بكم في دولة قطر والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وكما نحن موجودون هنا في مبنى متخصص فقط للأبحاث لم يكن غريبا على جامعة قطر أن تحتضن هكذا مؤتمر المؤتمر الدولي حول السبخات في قطر شكرا جامعة قطر شكرا دكتور حسن بن راشد درهم على هذه الكلمة والآن ننتقل للفقرة الثانية ونرحب فيها بالأستاذ جاكير بكسي نائب المدير العام المدير التنفيذي للعمليات Now we shall welcome Mr. Jagir Baksi the Vice President and Ventures Manager at Exxon Mobil to have his words please Thank you Your Excellency Sheikh Dr. Fala bin Nasser Al Thani Minister of Environment and Climate Change Excellency Dr. Hassan Al Dirham President of Qatar University Professor Hamad Al Saad Al Khwari, Director of Environmental Science Center, distinguished senior leaders of Qatar University, and my colleagues and friends. Assalamu alaikum. I'm sincerely delighted to have this wonderful opportunity to be amongst you, to reflect on a topic that is as unique as Qatar itself Qatar Sabka sediments. This conference is set to create amazing knowledge sharing and new insights into the significance of Qatar Sabka to this country's history, geology, physical and chemical characteristics, biodiversity, and hopefully to provide new inspiration to protect and appreciate this feature that is truly globally rare and well-preserved right here in Qatar. Thank you to Qatar University and the Environmental Science Center for hosting this important conference of which ExxonMobil is a proud sponsor. ExxonMobil has always valued fundamental science, developing extensive capabilities through our global energy business for over 100 years. Our global efforts include working with many external organizations, collaborating across a broad spectrum of science-based organizations, including 80 universities around the world. 
but our relationship with Qatar University is one that is special and valued in that. In 2009, ExxonMobil Research Qatar was established at the Qatar Science and Technology Park with a mission to conduct impactful research to areas of common interest to the state of Qatar and to ExxonMobil. Since its inception, EMRQ has advanced projects in environmental management, water reuse, and geosciences. In co collaboration with the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, with Qatar University, and with the energy sector, Several of EMRQ's research programs find strong connection with the study of Qatar Sabka. Our geoscience research program has increased knowledge and understanding of Qatar's coastal systems, hydrologic cycle, and near surface geology. These activities are providing insight into several challenges recognized within the Qatar National Vision 2030. One of these challenges is groundwater sustainability which focuses on how groundwater resources can meet both the current generation and future generations needs without causing unacceptable consequence. As the country continues to grow and strive for its greater potential, water use will always remain a key consideration. The environmental management program has sought to increase our knowledge of coastal ecosystems, including mangroves, seagrass, and coral reefs. In 2015, EMRQ developed a habitat map for the entire Qatari Peninsula, the near shore environment, including Khor al Udaid, one of Qatar's most unique ecosystems. The habitat map was extensively upgraded in 2021 with high spatial res resolution satellite data and has since been shared with many stakeholders, including the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. The map is currently being used to support understanding of biodiversity and carbon sequestration potential of these near shore habitats. As an active partner and a member of the Qatar community, both as a company, but also as people from a company that calls Qatar home, ExxonMobil is motivated to help increase the resilience of Qatar's coastal ecosystems and preserve the beautiful sub subkas of Qatar for many generations to come. Once again, thank you to Qatar University for creating a most unique space for interdisciplinary experts from around the world to share, discuss, and learn about this unique feature of Qatar. Shukran Jazeera. Shukran Jazeera, highly appreciating the effort that is being conducting from Excon Mobile with Qatar University all over the, the time. Thank you, Mr. Jagir Baksi, the Vice President and Ventures Manager at Exxon Mobil for the words. Well, and now we're going to go to the third question, and we're going to go to the Dr. Hamad Al-Saad Al-Kouari, Mudir Merkaz Al-Alum Al-Biyya, who is the Dr. Hamad Al-Saad Al-Kouari, Mudir Merkaz Al-Alum Al-Biyya. السلام عليكم أرحب بسعادة الدكتور رئيس الجامعة الدكتورة نائب الرئيس للبحث والدراسات العليا بالضيوف الكرام بالمشاركين من داخل وخارج الدولة لدينا مشاركين أشكرهم على حضورهم من أستراليا وأمريكا الشمالية وأمريكا الجنوبية وأوروبا وأيضا بعض الدول المجاورة في حديثي سأتحدث عن البعد التاريخي للسباخ وأهميتها ولماذا الاهتمام بدراستها السباخ كمصطلح هو مصطلح, مصطلح عربي وهذا المصطلح معروف من يعني عدة سنوات وسنوات كثيرة ويستخدم في المصطلح في حتى في المراجع الأجنبية يستخدم تستخدم هذه الكلمة للدلالة على الأرض المحية والمالحة بشكل عام 
وردت كلمة السباق في معجم لسان العرب لابن منظور وهو أول من أشار إلى كلمة سباق ونحن نتحدث الآن عن فترة في القرن الرابع عشر ميلادي بمعنى أن هذا التعريف أو من أطلق كلمة السباق منذ أكثر من سبعة قرون ابن منظور وصف السباق بوصف دقيق جدا تحدث عن أنها الأرض التي تعلوها الملوحة ولا تكاد ينبت فيها نبات أيضا تحدث أيضا عن بعض صفاتها التي الآن يعني نراها أمامنا أن المياه في هذه البيئة يعلوها الطحالب وهي بذلك تحمل كل مواصفات السبخة الحديثة كيف كانت البدايات؟ بداية الاهتمام بالصبخة الصبخة ما كما ذكر سعادة رئيس الجامعة بدايتها كانت في الستينات ونتيجة اكتشاف النفط في نهاية الأربعينات والخمسينات بدأت الشركات البترول تهتم بالمنطقة هذه ولماذا هذه المنطقة تحتوي هذا الكم أو هذه الخزانات الهائلة من البترول والنفط دون سواها فبدأوا يدرسون سطح الصخور السطحية في هذه المنطقة انطلاقا من مفهوم يؤمن به جميع الجيولوجيين الحاضر مفتاح الماضي بمعنى أن ما يجري الآن هو بالتأكيد جرى في عهود سابقة بوتيرة متفاوتة زمنيا بوتيرة زمنية متفاوتة في 62 معدن الدولوماي تم العثور عليه من ألنس ويلز ونشر في مجلة نيتشر سنة 62 لماذا الاهتمام بهذا المعدن معدن الدولومات وصخور الدولومايت هو معدن الدولومايت هي عبارة عن كربونات كالسيوم ودائما تكون مصاحبة للصخور الجيرية الكربونات كالسيوم الاهتمام بها لأن وجد أن الخزانات الجوفية والمكامن النفطية في قطر وفي الخليج أساسا تتكون من صخور الدولومايت أو جزء كبير منها يتكون من صخور الدولومايت ولذلك بدأ الاهتمام والبحث عنا سطحيا لفهم كيفية تكون هذه الخزانات على سبيل المثال متكون الخف الخف فورميشن في قطر في في راس لفان هذا هي الطبقة الخازنة الرئيسية للغاز في قطر هذا يتكون من أساسا من صخور الدولومايت كذلك متكون العرب هذه الخزانات هي الرئيسية في في تخان العد الشرقي وميدان محزم وهي أيضا كمتكون أو كتتابع صخري أيضا يعني منتشر في قطر والسعودية فإذا الدولومايت بدأ الآن يثير اهتمام الناس الدولومايت هذا اللي مكون الصخور كيف ظروف تكوينه وكيف نشأ 62 64 هذا الرجل اللي هو جين شين استقر في قطر وبدل يبحث او يعني يدرس الصخور السطحيه والف كتاب ايضا يعني فتره وجوده في قطر الف كتاب عن قطر ذكر فيه تفاصيل حياته في تلك الفتره واشار الى ملاحظاته عن الصخور في 75 شركه شيل بالتعاون مع جامعه لندن اصدرت كتاب عن السباخ وكان في أشياء كثيرة مفصلة وقام بتحرير رئيس شركة شيل الآن ننتقل إلى ما عملت قطر أو مساهمات الجامعة في في هذه البيئة المهمة في قطر في 61 فريق بحثي الدكتور محمود عاشور كتب كتاب أو أصدروا كتاب عن السبخات في قطر وفيها تفصيل عن أنواعها وصفاتها أيضا مركز العلوم البيئية أيضا كمساهمة منه في الاهتمام بهذه البيئة أصدر كثير من الكتب عن النباتات الأليفة وعن أشجار المنغروف التي تمثل جزء مهم من بيئات السباح في سنة 89 قاد المركز أو كانت له الريادة في حملة استزراع أشجار القرم التي تمثل أيضا جزء مهم في من بيئة السباخ 
الان التعاون البحثي يعني هذه كانت البدايات التعاون البحثي قادنا الى وخصوصا مع شركه اكس الموبل وهو شريك رئيسي في في التعاون في هذا الخصوص اللي هي دراسه بيئه الصبخات نتيجه هذا التعاون تم تقدم الى احد الملصقات او يعني ملصق في مؤتمر اللي هو جيولوجي النفط الاي بي جي هذا الاي بي جي هو مؤتمر عالمي يعقد في امريكا سنويا يتوافد الى كل المتخصصين في علوم الارض الملصق اللي تقدمنا به فاز او كان احسن عشر احسن عشر ملصقات بحثيه في ذلك المؤتمر واخذ له سخم عالمي زخم عالمي بحكم انه حط تفاصيل عن سباخ لم تكن يعني معروفه في لدى الكثير من الباحثين في ذلك الوقت. ايضا احنا زملائنا يعملون مع جامعه تكساس اي ان ام في دراسه الصخور الجيريه التي ترسبت في بيئات شبيهه ببيئه السباخ. الان بيئه السباخ فتحت المجال انه طيب هل هذه بيئه السباخ هي الوحيده اللي لها هذه الصفات؟ أو أن هناك بيئات أخرى تكون قريبة منها طبعا التعاون البحثي قادي لأن هناك صخور جيري صخور جيرية أيضا قريبة من بيئة السباخ المنح البحثية التي يعني تم إنجازها وهي مرتبطة ببيئة السباخ كثير منها هذه ثلاثة أمثلة للمنح التي تم الحصول عليها من صندوق القطري لرعاية البحث في مجملها يعني كميزانيه لهذه البحوث في حدود المليونين و800 الف دولار كانت مع شركاء من جامعات مرموقه من من اي تي اتش في سويسرا جامعه تورنتو مؤسسه سبايس اكس وتمت في هذه البحوث او يعني مخرجات هذه الابحاث او هذه المنح البحثيه كانت كثيره عشرات الابحاث المرموقة والتي نشرت في مجلات عالمية أيضا المنح البحثية هذه تم توظيف أو تم تخريج طلاب ماجستير وطالبة دكتوراه مع موجودة معنا الدكتورة زلفة وأيضا تتعاون معنا بالتعاون مع قسم العلوم البيولوجية البيولوجية والبيئية هذه أيضا نتيجة الاهتمام أو التسليط الضوء على هذه البيئة المهمة وماذا بعد الآن إحنا تطلعاتنا في المستقبل إن شاء الله أو هي الآن بدأت أن نبحث أكثر في في هذه السباخ وفي مكوناتها وفي الكائنات التي تعيش فيها فتوجهنا الآن إلى دراسة البكتيريا التي تكون هذه المعادن أو هذه الرواسب على المستوى الخلية وعلى مستوى أيضا الجيني نعمل أيضا حاليا مع دعم الجامعة للحصول على كرسي اليونسكو ومخصص للأنظمة البيئية للسبخات ولذلك وذلك توفير دعم عالمي لهذه البيئات في قطر للفت الانتباه لأهمية هذه أيضا إن شاء الله بنعمل مع وزارة البلدية والبيئة في يعني في تحديد او في تحويل هذه السباخ السباخ الى محميات طبيعيه مثل روضه العديد مثل خور العديد واسود النتيل هي الان محميات رسميه في الدوله ولكن تطلع الى ان تكون سبخات مثل تخان ومسعيد ودوحه في شاخ هي ايضا من المحميات التي يعني تكون ضمن الاهتمام الدولي فيها. في النهاية اسمحوا لي أن أشكر الفريق اللي اشتغل أو الذي عمل بجهد كبير على التنظيم الزملاء والزميلات في المركز أشكرهم جزيل الشكر وأشكركم على حسن الاستماع إذا حضورنا الكريم تكوين الخف 1991 أول فريق بحثي أو فريق بحثي من هنا من جامعة قطر يصدر كتاب عن السبخات فوز أحد الملصقات في مؤتمر سنوي ووصولا إلى استمرار البحوث ومحاولة الحصول على كرسي في اليونسكو للأنظمة البيئية للسبخات
ليس غريبا أن نعرف هذا الزخم المعرفي من أستاذ الدكتور حمد الكواري كونه مدير أو كون حتى مركز العلوم البيئية هو المنظم لهذا المؤتمر المؤتمر الدولي لسبخات في دولة قطر فشكرا الأستاذ الدكتور حمد السعد الكواري على هذا الكم المعرفي وعلى حضورك وعلى هذه الكلمة مشكورا إذا حضورنا الكريم نصل وإياكم إلى ختام أولى فقرات هذا المؤتمر ندعوكم جميعا إلى استراحة قصيرة فيها من المشروبات وفيها من الخفائف وندعوكم أيضا دعوة كريمة لحضور معرض الصور وهو معرض يعرض صور مختلفة للسبخات هنا في قطر تفضلوا بحضور هذا المعرض والاستراحة مشكورين يعطيكم العافية Um, switch the language to in English since all of the rest of the topics are in English. But first, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to ask how is your stomach? Hope it's full now. <laughs> and how is your mood? I hope we are all ready to start the, uh, the panel discussion or the next session, which is going to be a panel discussion that goes under the topic of general overview of the Sabha in Qatar, moderated by Mr. Saeed Al-Mir, to welcome and greet the rest of the moderators. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning to everyone. First, I'd like to welcome everyone today in the session and uh, sponsors, visitors, speakers, researchers, and students. This session is going to be for two hours, inshallah, and we will give 30 minutes for each speaker, and we will take last five minutes for questions. For this, the time is limited, actually, you know. For this, I won't go that much about background, but I can give brief background for each speaker. The first speaker is going to be, inshallah, Dr. Tommaso Puntanali. Dr. Tommaso is from Switzerland, from Space Exploration Institute of Neustadt and the University of Basel. His research and geobiology field is working most of the time he works on ESA EXO Mars mission, which is looking for signs, you know, of life on Mars. It's really interesting. He is a professor at Qatar University. He joined recently, like three days ago. And I wish for him a really good time, you know, and research, you know, uh, circumstances here. He works on some projects on Sbaha of Qatar. His research on microbe, mineral extractions that lead of the formation of morphological and geochemical biosignature related to the study of early life on Earth and search for life on other planets. I'm going to give him the space to show his work, and then we're going to take five minutes, you know, for questions. Please. So thank you so much for the introduction, and welcome again, everyone. So the goal of my presentation is that of giving you a general introduction to this first SAPCA conference. And I will do that by trying to explore um, the connection that exists between the SAPCA and the various research field that will be presented and discussed uh, in more detail during the various sessions of this conference. And I hope that at the end of my talk and even more at the end of the three days of conferences, conference, it will be clear why a place like this one that you see in the picture that may at first glance look a quite uh, uh, an appealing, inhospitable place uh, is, in fact, a 
real treasure for scientific research. And what you see in this image here is the supratidal zone of the Dohat Faishak Sapka, which is one uh, of the Sapka located along the west coast of Qatar. And uh, um, I like to start the presentation with this, uh, showing this Sapka because as Dr. Hamad said also earlier in his presentation, this Sapka was studied already in the 60s. And many key concepts about the formation of evaporitic mineral came from the study of this uh, very same place. And since now 10 years, in collaboration with Dr. Hamad and many other colleagues based both at Qatar University and in other research institutes worldwide, we continue to study this SAPCA. And as you can see in this satellite image, this SAPCA is forming where coastal morphology is creating this kind of embayment, this shallow water, low energy basin. And here the water is flowing in, and sometimes there is also some groundwater coming from the land. And due to the arid condition that characterize this region, uh, the seawater and the groundwater progressively evaporate, forming this soup of evaporitic mineral. And this process is leading to the formation of this typical and so-called uh, evaporitic sequence. And usually the first mineral that form are carbonate, uh, that in the case of the sapca that you see here are a mixture of aragonite and dolomite. Then usually sulfate mineral are precipitating where the water become even more evaporated. And then in the end you have a, a variety of different salts. And nowadays this mode of mineral precipitation is relatively rare and the sapcas of Qatar are among the few places where you can see this process going on. However, we have good reason to believe that um, during some periods of the history of our planet, this mode of sedimentation was very uh, common. And in fact, there are uh, several sedimentary sequences, like you see here the Dolomite Mountain, that are almost entirely comprised of mineral that are very similar to the one that you can see forming today in the SAPCA. And for this reason, in many of the abstract, and you have already heard that this SAPCA is like a modern analog or natural laboratory, because it's an excellent place to really understand the mechanisms that lead to the formation of that sedimentary rock. And it's an excellent place where to develop new geochemical and geobiological proxies. And then you can test them under control modern condition. And considering the importance that the oil sector has for the economy of Qatar, it worth mentioning that this uh, evaporitic sequence is a very common, uh, of this mineral are very common in oil and gas reservoir. In fact, carbonate, like for example, dolomite, often has a very good porosity that is very good as a uh, reservoir rock. And the evaporites that form on top, they tend to have a very uh, low uh, porosity. They are very compact. And this is an excellent cap rock that prevent the gas and oil to escape from the basin. So one of the session of the conference that will be tomorrow, and we'll start with the keynote talk of uh, uh, Dr. Fadil Saduni, will be about this link, uh, so the SAPCA as a natural laboratory to understand the formation of hydrocarbon reservoir. And you will, be, you will hear more about this subject. And considering the importance that these rocks have for uh, this um, <coughs> economically very important oil reservoir, one may think that everything is known about it. There is no mystery left about the formation of this mineral. And this is not really the case. And one notable example about, let's call them mysterious mineral or enigmatic mineral, is dolomite. And you will hear many times the word dolomite during the next uh, three days. And there will be uh, a dedicated uh, session of this conference uh, that we call the, the dolomite problem. And I was uh, glad to see from the title of the keynote talk of Maurice Tucker that we may be close to finally find a final solution to this uh, dolomite problem. And uh, we will, uh, and many speakers will talk about dolomite uh, later during the conference, but only in two words. 
one of the major problems with dolomite is that seawater and also this water that you see here in this soil is super saturated with respect to dolomite. However, if you collect this water, you analyze it, and you reproduce a solution that has the same uh, chemistry, same amount of magnesium, calcium, same amount of carbonate, in the laboratory at low temperature, you cannot form dolomite. You end up forming only aragonite or, or calcite. And so we, we, we have a problem here that has been investigated for more than 200 years. And uh, a possible solution to this problem is that microbes may be involved in this mineralization process. And uh, uh, this hypothesis was uh, first proposed in 95 by Krizovgonov Vasconcelos that was doing his PhD in the group of uh, uh, Judy McKenzie. And both they then were my PhD supervisor. Uh, and uh, um, again, Chris will explain you that in much more detail. But in two words, what they have done is that they have shown that if you take, uh, so they were studying modern dolomite formation in this hypersaline lagoon that is located in Brazil, Lagoa Vermelha. And what they have shown is that if you take the water from this lagoon and uh, you try to precipitate mineral under sterile condition, nothing is forming. While if in the same solution with the same chemistry, you also uh, leave the, the microorganisms that are present in the lagoon, you can uh, precipitate dolomite at low temperature. And so this, uh, this finding uh, of, of, of uh, this hypothesis of microbial dolomite that took a, a, an important fraction of the career of many of the people that are present in this audience was uh, of great inspiration also for the work that we have been conducted here in the last 10 years in the uh, Dohat, Faishak, Sapka, and other Sapkas um, in Qatar. And uh, uh, actually, you do not need to, uh, to, to have a microscope to see that these microbes are important also in this apparently inhospitable environment. And you see from these satellite images that all what is black here in this figure in the intertidal zone these are actually uh, microbial mat. And I show you a picture of this, uh, of exactly the same uh, uh, area that was displayed in the satellite image. And you see that all the intertidal zone is fully covered by this slimy uh, microbial mat. And you see that inside the mat, you have all this gel and all this like grayish layer and these are minerals, including uh, dolomite, that are precipitating uh, in association with the microorganism. And so several of the uh, presentation during this conference, the one of uh, uh, Maria Dietrich, uh, the, one, the one of Zulfa, several uh, presentation, will show you, will report some of the studies that we have done. So we have characterized the diversity of this microbial mat, Zac di Doreto, we have seen really uh, the, how the metabolism of this microbe influence the geochemistry of the poor water. And we have tried to link biology with the precipitation of this uh, uh, evaporitic mineral. And you will hear much more uh, about that in details. But I would like to emphasize that uh, not only the respiration of the microorganism, but also these uh, so-called extracellular polymeric substances that is like a term to refer to this jelly material that uh, microbes excrete outside from the cell. That is what you see here, the slime in the microbial mat. We think that is very, very important for the formation of these, um, these evaporitic minerals. And here you see a scanning electron microscopy image of the same mat. So if you take a piece of this mat and you look it under the microscope, you, uh, you really see that minerals, like for example, this dolomite rom that you see at the center of the picture, is nucleating and developing within a matrix comprised of these extracellular polymeric substances that you see. These are this kind of uh, web-like uh, honeycomb structure that you see here in this picture. And so, uh, 
all this research to really summarize 10 years of research in two wars uh, led us to reformulate a little bit like the model or uh, the, the, what we propose being the key mechanism for dolomite formation in the SAPCA. In the initial war, the one done in the 60s, they were attributing dolomite formation to evaporation that was causing uh, uh, evaporated water that were extremely rich in magnesium and also the precipitation of sulfate were further increasing the magnesium to calcium ratio by removing uh, the calcium from, from, from the poor water that was going into the gypsum. While we still believe that evaporation is very important and you need a, a solution with a very high magnesium to calcium ratio, but do we think that the link between evaporation and dolomite formation is a little bit more sophisticated? And what we are proposing is that the evaporation that is causing this high salinity is also creating a very strong ecological stress on these microbes, on these uh, microorganisms, and uh, which in turn cause these microbes to produce a lot of this slime, a lot of this EPS. And we have shown that this EPS is of key, for, of key importance for uh, the nucleation stage uh, and the incorporation of magnesium into the dolomite crystal at low temperature. And we will hear much more about that later in the conference. And I just show you um, a quick uh, video that Zulfa took uh, how many years, five years ago? And, uh, uh, and this is to show you about the importance of this line in the SAPCA that you don't see it when you walk uh, on the dunes. You would not say that there is so much uh, EPS around. And, uh, oops. Sorry. And you see that without the slime, it would be simply impossible to, to slide on, uh, on sand like I did in this video. Now, this is the same pond that you have seen in the video, like uh, some days later or in another season. And you see that the salinity can increase up to the point that halite is precipitating in that same place. And incredibly, some micro this microbial map that are living there, they can stand and survive this uh, extreme condition. And there will be tomorrow a dedicated session about uh, microbial ecology in extreme evaporitic environment that will start with the keynote talk of Dimitri uh, Meyer. And one thing that I, will, I would like to point out about that is that uh, the salinity in the SAPCA is not always the same, but you have huge variability. So you can go from two times the salinity of seawater to 10, 15 times within like an afternoon sometime. And this huge ecolo ecological stress caused this place to be very inhospitable to evolve eukaryotic life because primitive life and microorganisms like bacteria and archaea are very good in occupying new niches. They are very flexible in terms of adaptation, but they are bad in competition, in competing with eukaryotic life. And so this sap, in a way, can be seen like a unique environment where we can see a biosphere that probably was, that today is rare, but it was the type of biosphere that was present on Earth before the advent of, before the evolution of eukaryotic microorganisms. And uh, um, about this concept of devolution, uh, I would like to point out that most of what we know about the evolution and how life, life looked like in the past come from the work of generations of paleontologists that have studied the fossil record preserved in the uh, in, in ancient uh, rock formation in ancient mountain. But I would like to uh, remind you that most of this information is limited to the Phanerozoic, which is only uh, about one eighth, one ninth of the history of our planet, which is actually uh, much, much older. And with respect to the Phanerozoic, we know much, much less about the evolution of life and how life looked like in this very long period of time called the Precambrian. And there is, of course, there are several reasons. One is that because plate tectonic tend to destroy the oldest rock, you know, that all the rock on Earth keep being continuously recycled. 
So even though fossil form, they are destroyed and not preserved. But there is also another factor that is very important, which is that life start to do biominerals, so like shells and bones, which are the only thing that usually get preserved in a fossil, only late, only about uh, 600, 500 million, uh, millions of years ago. And this make it much more difficult to study and uh, understand life earlier. And um, we have extraordinary cases where you can find fossil of microbes preserved in church. Like this is uh, uh, an example of a rock that I was studying years ago. And this, you see the two dots in the middle of the image and this kind of worm. These are probably uh, fossil of bacteria that are preserved in a rock that predate the advent of uh, controlled biomineralization. However, this is a relatively young rock, and if you go even further back in time, you will see that what are proposed as microfossil are often even more uh, uh, distorted. The, 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 the sphere or the putative microfossil are morphologically very simple, and it's often very, very difficult, simply based on morphology, to even be sure that what you're looking at is a real microfossil and not simply a bubble or a feature that form through completely abiotic processes. And uh, microbial math, in a way, they uh, mitigate a bit this problem of studying early life because when microbial math are growing, like here in the Safkas uh, of Qatar, they interact with the sedimentary processes. Sometimes they see simply trap and binds on sediment. Sometimes, like we have seen before, this layer inside the microbial mat, they directly induce the precipitation of mineral like, uh, like dolomite. And uh, also, when all the organic material, so the, 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 the biomass of this microorganism that has no shells, no bones, is degraded, so nothing is left of the original microorganism, but you can still see the shape of the microbial mat. And this uh, microbial mat creates some, some, some microbial-induced sedimentary structure that have a very good preservation potential. And for example, in this image here, you see on the left a living, a modern microbial mat uh, from the Coradaid Sapka. And on the right, what could be a possible fossil equivalent uh, that you see the same uh, similar lamination, this fenestre that may have been the place where the, the gas produced the microorganisms were and that deformed the sediment in this way. And what is very interesting about this feature is that they are present in some extremely old sedimentary sequence. So the, the example that I've showed you, it was photographed in, Austra in Australia during a fieldwork that was led by Martin Van Kranenden that is also one of the, the, the participants and keynote speaker, speaker of this conference. And so this uh, uh, microbial-induced sedimentary structure and stromatolites are very important to study early life, and today they represent among the oldest morphological fossil and evidence showing that life and microbial life may have already existed very early in the history of our planet. And, uh, in this figure here, I anticipate a bit what I guess Martin Van Kranendonk will explain in more detail during his keynote talk. And on the left, you see this uh, ancient rock that have almost 3.5 uh, billions of years, so 3,500 million, super old. And on the right, what we have proposed that they may be the modern equivalent. And you see some, 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 some detail on the morphology of this sediment that looks very similar on the, on the right and, uh, and on the left. And so for this reason, for those of you that will come tomorrow to the, to the Coral da Itzapka, I'd like to, 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 to propose you to imagine and to look at this environment also with this idea that if you would have a, 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 a time machine and you would be able to go back to the early Precambrian, maybe, this is the type of landscape and this is the uh, habit that life had uh, at the origin of the uh, history of our planet. 
Now, last part, Mars, the connection between the SAPCA and Mars. So since more now than five years, I'm dedicating most of my time to the preparation of the uh, ExoMars mission, which is a major astrobiology program led by the European Space Agency. And this mission has the very ambitious goal of possibly finding evidence for the existence of extraterrestrial life on Mars. And with respect to other rovers from NASA that are already on Mars and they're already looking for uh, traces of life, what is unique and new about the ExoMars rover is the presence of this drilling device that you see there in front of the rover that will allow us for recovering sample down to a depth of uh, a maximum of two meters. And this is expected to uh, dramatically increase the chances of finding fossil organic molecules that would be a very good evidence for the existence of past life. And in this picture here, you see the, the, the real um, uh, ExoMars rover. And unfortunately, the mission should have been launched this last September, but because the launcher and the mission was done in collaboration with the Russian Space Agency, due to the war in Ukraine, the, this collaboration had to be suspended. Now it's uh, uh, interrupted. And so this caused, unfortunately, uh, a delay. And so the European agency will have to replace and find solution to replace some of the components of the mission that were originally provided by the uh, Russian. And uh, in this mission, I'm part of the science team and I'm quite of two of the instruments that will be on board of the rover, which are the panoramic camera and a close-up camera. And this close-up camera um, is, is often described as the end lens of the geologist, that you can use it to look at this sedimentary structure and potentially microbial induced sedimentary structure that I've shown you before. And the principal investigator, the main mind behind this instrument is present in the audience, this is Jean-Luc Josset, and he will give you on uh, Wednesday a keynote talk about the uh, ExoMars mission. And I show you only very briefly like a, a short video that is summarizing the, the different phases uh, of the mission. So the, the rover will be launched in probably in 2028 from, uh, from the Earth. It will take about nine months, depending on the orbit that you choose. It can take also longer to do the trip to Mars. And then, well, the carrier will get close to the Martian atmosphere, it will release this landing module, and there will be this very thrilling uh, entry, descend, and landing phase. And hopefully everything will go well in this phase. And then the rover will unfold its uh, wings made of solar panel. And start uh, exploring the surface of Mars. And the rover is equipped with several cameras, but also with several uh, instruments that allows you to get information about the mineralogy and the chemistry of the rock. And as I said before, of key importance, uh, here you see Clupi like the instrument that was developed at the space, most of the Space Exploration Institute where I'm currently working. And it will be used to take images also of this small core that will be then analyzed inside the body of the rover with some uh, microscope, uh, Raman spectrometer, and even a mass spectrometer. And the data will be sent back uh, to the Earth. So in what type of uh, life are we looking for on Mars and what is the connection with the Saukas of Qatar? So as you may know, today Mars uh, is quite inhospitable at the surface. There are many reasons, but the main one is very simple, is that it's very cold. The average temperature is minus 70, which is too uh, cold for liquid water, which is considered a key requirement for life uh, as we know it. Uh, however, thanks to uh, 
several years of studies of this planet, and particularly thanks to the data that have been produced during the last year by several rovers that are exploring Mars, we are now pretty sure that early in the history of Mars, there was a time where there was a lot of liquid water at the surface of Mars. Of course, this is a rendering. We have no idea if it was so widespread or if we had only small pond or only sapcas. However, uh, we think that early Mars, in this period that was called Noachian, that was between 3.7 and 4 billions of years ago, was much more hospitable than it is today. And so uh, if we assume that life evolved at the same rate in the, in the whole solar system, which is, of course, an hypothesis, but it's probably the, the, the best, the most reasonable hypothesis that we can do if we want to look for life on Mars, uh, we can we, we will look for uh, not for evidence or living life on Mars uh, because today is in hospital, but we are going to look for evidence of fossil life that is preserved in sedimentary rock that formed very early in, his, in the history of the planet. And the type of fossil that we are expecting to find, as I said before, if we assume that the evolution at the same rate, is not, we are not expecting to find fossil of dinosaur of uh, eukaryotic animal, but we are expecting to find uh, fossil that are very similar to those that we find in this early Archean rock here on Earth. And so for the same reason that before I proposed that the SAPCAS is, are a good analog for the early Earth, also, uh, we can see the subcast as an uh, analog to define and to study and see which kind of uh, biosignature we may find on Mars. And I have to say that, in a way, uh, the SAPCA is an even better analog to Mars than to the early Earth because Mars did not have plate tectonic, and so a lot of this uh, Archean sedimentary rock suffer a lot of metamorphism, so a lot of this uh, structure have been deformed and destroyed, which make it very difficult to, to, to interpret them. While instead of Mars, if we assume that there was water and then it dried out completely progressively, we can see it like really like a place like the Sapka. And if there was life in this basin on Mars, at the end, it may have been in a very similar situation that what we have regularly in this Sapka, where you have water, that is drying out completely, producing also this evaporitic mineral that in turn uh, uh, trap these uh, organic molecules of the putative Martian biomass. And uh, uh, I show you this picture that was taken by the NASA rover Curiosity that revealed the presence of some polygonal uh, vein-like structure that are very similar to the structure that you see in the microbial mark of Qatar, and so there was a debate about if this could be like a fossil equivalent of this microbial mass. So the conclusion is that they are not, that they form through abiotic processes. But this proves how interesting is to study how this feature form here, to be ready and to know when you see an image like that, if you take an image like that on Mars, what you need to check, what you do, what are the morphological details that you need to, 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 to image in detail to uh, test this possibility that maybe they are fossil of primitive microbial life. And this is another image that shows a comparison between this same formation with the polygonal structure and uh, um, a sapca, the coral diet sapca in Qatar. And you see that many things may appear very, very similar and they, look, uh, they deserve to be uh, explored in detail. And uh, during the, the the session on Mars, there will be two cases that will report to Francisca Blattman will present some research that we have done together here in the Sapcas of Qatar that is specifically dedicated to, to, to so the, the goal is really to try to see um, what, if this polygonal, for example, this microbial mud that showed this, that created this polygonal feature if uh, you can form them also abiotically, or if there are different types of this polygonal feature, and some of them you can uh, 
link them with like a microbial process. And then we have also studied how this living microbial mat are then transformed into lithified and solid rock. And so you see on the left, the living microbial mat, and on the right, what we think is like the fossil equivalent of this uh, uh, intertidal flat. And this is exactly the type of morphological biosignature that you can analyze like with an instrument like Lupi during a mission like ExoMars. Yeah. And uh, I conclude with this one that uh, I, 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 today I talk, I, I gave a quite visual talk, but uh, we did also a lot of geochemistry in the SAPCA. And uh, so the case of uh, the study that Francisca Blattman will present is about the morphology. But we also did studies about how the biomass that is uh, living in this, in, in this APCA is trapped into the uh, evaporitic mineral that precipitate. And Zach Di Loreto will give a talk about that and will show how the biomass that is present in the sediment can be trapped and preserved into the gypsum crystal that you see on the upper left corner. And how this biomarker can be detected with some uh, technologies like Raman that will be uh, on board of the ExoMars rover. And so you can again see if this would be an ideal sample or an ideal situation to, uh, uh, to find on Mars. And in that case, we would so see at the surface the, this uh, sediment that we can link to sediment to, to evaporitic processes. And then we would drill and try to get and find some gypsum like it's forming here in the SAPCA. And this gypsum will be analyzed inside the rover and possibly we will detect these uh, fossil organic molecules. So I finish on the, on the first slide. I wish you a very nice three days of conference. I hope it will further strengthen the link between these various research field. And uh, I hope that this will only the first of a series of SAPCA conference and that in the future we will add new uh, title and new sessions uh, to the future conferences. Thank you all for coming. Thank to my collaborators and to the many people that uh, helped me to do this research in Qatar and of course to the sponsor of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tommaso, for all of that interesting work and not only on Earth, even on Mars. Thank you very much. We have just a few minutes, you know, for a few questions, of course, but please be sure you have like, you know, clear question and short as much as you can. Yeah, sure. No, it is, and, um, I mean, for the field of uh, early life and finding biosignature, unfortunately, dolomite is not like uh, a direct evidence for the existence of past life because this problem of forming dolomite is true at low temperature, while dolomite can form at high temperature through metamorphic reaction. So it's, you cannot say that when you see dolomite, it means that there was microbial activity. However, it is a central point of our research, and we are trying to find something that microbial dolomite is that is different from the dolomite that form at high, uh, higher temperature abiotically. So it's a very good point, and it's central to our research to possibly uh, consider a type of dolomite as a biosignator. This would be extremely helpful, especially because there are many magnesium-rich carbonate on Mars. So we may have the same dolomite problem also on Mars. Dr. Pava? So uh, we are expecting um, simple organic molecules, but that they are sufficiently complex, like lipid biomarkers, or that are sufficiently complex to be sure that they did not form through Fischer-Trop reaction. So we are still looking for like uh, uh, some complexity to, to, to be able to be sure that they are really the remains of ancient biomass. Uh, 
classification of uh, the sediment morphology. I mean, embedded uh, domal features that can maybe of microbial origin. You, you mean on Mars or on Earth that we can use? Uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I am also the idea that there are already several half evidence for the existence of life on Mars, but because they are often uh, mostly morphological and uh, not, we do not have really like uh, chemical data that are unambiguous and, and, and these organic molecules may also have form abiotically. And because the claim about the existence of life on Mars is so important, it's important to remain prudent. But, but there are many things that are easier to explain with microbes and very difficult to explain with a coincidence of abiotic factors and abiotic processes. We're, we're gonna take last question, you know. Thomas, uh, I have this uh, question. Okay, when you look at the microbial matter in Mars, it's the same microbial matter that you look in the planet here, which means in Mars, you have the same kind of life. It could be a different. So that's again, we have really no no clue, and we have because to be away, you know? completely open minded. We don't know if life is something spontaneous that form uh, everywhere when you have the, the the key requirements, or whether there was one source and life is spreading in the universe. That's a very good, uh, fascinating question. And, I have no Thank answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thomas, again. Thank you. The second speaker, Dr. Zolfa Ali, is postdoctoral at Qatar University. Her Bachelor of Chemistry from UAE University. And this is really interesting. Her Master in Business Administration, MBA, from Manchester Business School. But she has another master and PhD in biological and environment science from Qatar University. She fixed it, huh? I'm fi <laughs> I fixed it. I came back to science. <laughs> Her PhD thesis was on the role of aerobic and dolomites formation in the evaporatic environments of Qatar, Spacha. Dr. Azulfa started as lab technician and then became a quality assurance manager. She worked as research assistant and as postdoc in NPRP and PDLA projects. I can give her the space to show us her work, please. Thank you, Dr. Said. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank you all for your attendance, as well as the organizer, organizers of uh, the first uh, SAPHA conference, so we can meet and share our findings. Today, I will talk about exploring, exploring the role of uh, aerobic bacteria and their exobolomeric substances. Uh, in the formation of uh, uh, carbonate uh, minerals, I will share you with, the, uh, with you the findings of uh, a research that has been carried on uh, maybe for a decade in the frame of uh, my PhD uh, thesis and in the frame of uh, several NPRB grants uh, that was provided by QNRF in the uh, collaboration manner, uh, with Environmental Study Center and the Department of Biological and Environmental Science at Qatar University. So I will go through an introduction, talk about research goals, and then share with you some of our research outcomes, then uh, end up by conclusions. So uh, today I will share with you some of the microenvironments, more about our research work on these microorganisms. So as mentioned earlier, magnesium rich carbonates are common sequences uh, uh, Asian, of Asian sedimentary sequences. Uh, in which dolomite, as mentioned earlier, is an important uh, oil and gas reservoir. Qatar is evidenced, as we know today, as one of the uh, uh, rare environments on Earth in which dolomite is in continuous uh, process. 
The most recent works has confirmed the importance of microbial mass in, dolom in uh, the formation of orthogenic uh, dolomite. Studies that has been conducted in the field of geobiology has showed that microbial activity promotes the form formation of uh, magnesium-rich carbonates at low temperature. So, this coming back. So we can, so we can. Uh, uh, so uh, in this regard, Sabha represents a unique environment in which we can investigate the involvement of bacteria or microorganisms in dolomite or in uh, mineral formation. We consider the di dynamic evaporit evaporitic uh, characteristics of the uh, sabha that is crucial for uh, precipitation of mineral. We expect as well that the microbial mass that are usually occur within a sabha environments are dynamic microbial ecosystem that support uh, with variable uh, nutrient support uh, sources that support diversity of uh, activities. And these micro uh, in environments that are, are formed within, within sabha support the activity of various microorganisms. Previous studies on sabha has focused only on anaerobic bacteria in dolomite, the role of anaerobic bacteria in dolomite formation. As an example, it has been reported that sulfur reduces, reducing bacteria can overcome uh, the kinetic barriers for dolomite formation by mainly uh, removing the sulfate uh, from the system uh, as it was thought that it is an inhibitor for dolomite formation. However, though this uh, hypothesis has been debated. Only at that time we started our research, few laboratory studies were uh, uh, focused or performed on aerobic bacteria. So our research is based on the hypothesis, or we suggest, we propose that aerobic bacteria and or their uh, exopolymeric substances play a crucial role in the formation of dolomite in the microbial mass of Qatar Sabha. So for this, we are, we are performing comprehensive multidisciplinary geobiological studies on both Doha Tushakh and Khol Adid Sabhas, which are the most prominent Sabhas in Qatar. So we hope to fill some of the knowledge gap by answering some uh, fundamental questions about what is the rule of bacteria? What is the rule of EPS? Which EPS is suitable for dolomite formation? What are the mechanisms and what are the environmental factors? So during the recent years, we uh, carried out many uh, field studies and trips to both Doha uh, Tibshakh and Khol Adeid Sabhas. Within these field studies, we collected a lot of samples, including microbial mass, Whole water, core water, and of course, uh, sediment uh, cores. These cores were subject, uh, these sediments, these samples were subject to uh, many uh, laboratory studies. First of all, we wanted to confirm the occurrence of carbonate minerals and specifically dolomite in these, subha, in these uh, uh, samples that has been collected uh, from Sabha. So uh, the core samples were subject, were uh, analyzed using uh, uh, scan electron microscopy, microscopy and EDS, and uh, uh, the result of the analysis confirmed the occurrence of several minerals, including, of course, gypsum, carbonates, and most imp importantly, uh, dolomite, which was further confirmed by XRD analysis. And we found out that uh, uh, layers enriched, or uh, abun the abundance of the dolomite was found at layers below uh, between 30 and 40 centimeters. Now, we want to use these natural samples in our, we will we'll transfer these samples to our labs in which we want to apply them in uh, enrichment cultures that allow the growth of many organisms. From these enrichment cultures, we performed isolation and purification of aerobic halophilic heterotrophic bacteria. We obtained a large collection of uh, bacterial isolates. Uh, it was constructed and identified by 
molecular ribotyping. So we can see that we obtain a diverse collection of uh, aerobic bacteria. This uh, bacteria was isolated from the sediments that are associated with uh, dolomite formation in Sabha and mainly was dominated by the Virgi bacillus species. Now we obtained our uh, bacteria and we want to investigate their potential to form minerals uh, in the lab laboratory. So for this purpose, we modified in our labs an MD artificial medium, uh, MD1. This medium would reflect uh, uh, some parameters from uh, the natural environments uh, in, in, in terms of uh, magnesium calcium ratio and salinity. In this medium, we go on the bacteria since fewer cultures were grown and they then were observed to check the occurrence of minerals. These minerals were furtherly checked by microbial uh, observations. The observed, as you can see, we uh, obtained a mixture of different types of mineral, minerals. These minerals were recovered and furtherly uh, analyzed use, using SEM, scan electron microscopy and uh, ADX and SEM mapping. As you can see, we confirm the presence of different types of minerals in these pure cultures, such as uh, calcium carbonate, hydromagnesite, which, which is a hydrated uh, form of magnesium carbonate, and most importantly, the high magnesium calcite, which is considered as precursor for dolomite formation. These findings were furtherly confirmed by uh, the, the XRD analysis, as you can see from this uh, figure that we, uh, we detected the presence of high magnesium carbonate phases, but with variable incorporation of magnesium. So these microbial strains, aerobic bacteria, halophilic, heterotrophic strains, were able to form high magnesium calcite or carbonate phases in pure cultures. Now, to consider the variability of Sabha and uh, from our field studies and uh, Lab laboratory studies, we identified these three parameters, which is temperature, magnesium calcium ratio, and salinity with high variability as main components or main parameters that would affect mineral formation. So next, we investigated the role of these parameters in the formation of uh, high magnesium calcite uh, or min uh, mineral formation by these Virgin bacillus strains. So we uh, furtherly optimized, modified our media to address the variability in these conditions. So we prepared the artificial media with different uh, magnesium calcium ratio and we performed our ex experiments at different temperatures. As you can see from this figure that uh, um, high magnesium ca uh, carbonate phases were performed only at high, at high temperatures and salinity. As confirmed by uh, multivariant analysis, uh, we can say, although that this experimental approach, you, it may seem that it is far too simple to simulate the complexity of natural environment. However, however our analysis suggests that temperatures, salinity, and magnesium calcium ratio that favor the microbially mediated uh, magnesium um, rich carbonates are much higher than those that of uh, average seawater. So now we have we have to promote the subha water, uh, uh, the natural subha water, as uh, another factor, a uh, parameter for dolomite formation or magnesium rich carbonate formation. Consequently, we expect because we are working with uh, 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 bacteria that these parameters would. Uh, consequently affect the production of EPS. EPS is, we know that EPS is uh, mainly composed uh, by, of uh, carbohydrates and proteins, and it being stimulated as a response to environmental stress to protect the bacterial cells. It is reported that uh, the EPS mat matrix play or act as a nucleation template for binding magnesium and calcium cations. Also, it was reported that these functional groups of EPS uh, favor, likely by dehydration of magnesium, the incorporation of magnesium into the carbonate minerals. However, the, the, the mechanism by which this is being done is still 
uh, not well understood. So we wanted to study the influence of these three parameters on the production of EPS that is suitable for magnesium-rich carbonate formation. So we produced by using these parameters, we produced uh, uh, the EPS by our uh, aerobic strains at different salinities and temperatures. And what we obtained, you, as you can see with, uh, from this, the pointer will not work, from this uh, graph, that the portion, portions, uh, the red lines indicating the incorporation or the amount of magnesium that is incorporated in the minerals. As you can see, the uh, high portions of uh, total carbohydrates, the EPS that is characterized by the production of high magnesium calcite phases is uh, associated with uh, high proportions of total carbohydrates uh, with minor amounts of protein. So we know that uh, now we have uh, characterized the composition of the EPS in which that is suitable for the uh, uh, magnesium rich carbonate uh, uh, formation. We want to simplify again the system and uh, design a set of experiments in which we can address these parameters in a simple laboratory uh, systematic approach. So we address the composition of uh, EPS by replacing, by using exantan to represent carbohydrate and uh, using amino acids to uh, represent uh, proteins. And for the subha conditions, we used an evaporative seawater that is uh, of the composition of the poor water associated to dolomite formation. And then we use three modes for reaching supersaturation uh, in which we can supply, uh, we, we do the carbonate supply. From these experiments, just I'm showing you this table, I will not go into details, but we used many uh, uh, amino acids and uh, we did the experiment in the absence and presence of these organic molecules and we obtained very interested results that can be summarized here. So when using evap evaporatic solution, sorry, I have to rest. Thank you. Yeah. At, at, at the equal physiochemical conditions by using evaporatic solutions and using the ammonia drift uh, method for reaching supersaturation, we obtained only nisconite. Nisconite is a hydrated phase of magnesium carbonate. So, mm -hmm. However, when we use this evaporated solution, but with slow mixing uh, with bicarbonate, we obtained major amounts of aragonite. The most in interesting part, when we use the fast mixing with uh, bicarbonate, we could obtain in the control experiments that in the absence of organic molecules, we could, uh, could obtain uh, high magnesium calcite phases with small percentage of 35%, up to 35%. However, when we added the organic molecules to the system, we obtained further increase in the incorporation of uh, magnesium. So having this very interesting results, we want to extrapolate this simple uh, setting into the more complex natural uh, settings. So instead of using the organic molecules, we want to apply now the EPS that is produced by these microbes that are known to form carbonate minerals, magnesium rich carbonates. So we move to the next part and then we want to explore the EPS produce of this aerobic bacteria in the formation of magnesium rich carbonate. So we produced EPS at the favorable conditions uh, that uh, promote uh, high magnesium calcite formation. We extracted the EPS and we use this EPS, natural EPS, in our uh, precipitation experiments using the best method for uh, incorporation of magnesium, which is the fast mixing with uh, bicarbonate and using our evaporatic solution, which mimics subha, uh, subha uh, pore water composition. And what we obtained here, high magnesium calcite phases in the presence of EPS produced by one of our veggie, uh, bacillus strains. As you can see, if you compare with the control, we can see that uh, a higher amount of, amounts of magnesium 
are incorporated in the, the to the crystals, and we can see here, as even if you fail, it is very tiny, but there is a mole percentage of 35% in the control compared to mole percentage of 45, which is quite uh, a lot to, uh, to obtain when using our natural EPS. So to this, to this uh, we, we reached to this far in this, our experiments. We are still explore, exploring other factors, other components, other parameters that can help us or can promote uh, the incorporation of further incorporation of magnesium into the carbonate crystals. And uh, we are looking about the ancient uh, composition of seawater, and we're trying to find maybe other new parameters that could uh, yeah, answer the, the, our question about this uh, topic. So uh, now I can conclude that SABCHA, for us, it represents a natural laboratory to investigate biogeochemical processes. The aerobic bacteria, in specifically vegetable cellulose, can mediate, it's not potential, it can mediate the formation of very high magnesium carbonates. The evaporatic sea water, which is SABCHA water, combined with fast supply of carbonates, promote the formation of high magnesium uh, carbonate phases. By addition of organic molecules or EPS, we obtain further increase in uh, mole percentage of, uh, 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 of magnesium. So I think this result can provide an insi some insights for better, better linking the microbial activities and formation of uh, magnesium carbonates. So these are some of our publications during the recent years, and we are, we are still going on with this research. So now the, we have the, our new established biomodernization lab that uh, has been uh, uh, newly established. It's a new lab laboratory dealing with biomodels, and we continue using uh, SABCHA as our natural laboratory. This lab is, uh, uh, will be in a collaborative panel between uh, ESC, uh, um, Department of Biological and Environmental Science, and of course, in Jab uh, Qatar University. Of course, we will have other collaborators from elsewhere in the, in the world who, who is interesting, are interested in this uh, field of research. So by this, I come to the acknowledgement. I would like to thank Qatar University for providing this uh, great opportunities, for encouraging research, for having the fund to do, uh, to, uh, to do our studies. Of course, the generous grants of QNRF, without these grants, we would not be able to, uh, to do this uh, as much, uh, to have these interesting results. For sure, I will forever be thankful to Professor Nabil and uh, Professor, Professor Sabir Jawa, because the first, because they were my supervisors in my master's and PhD. Also, they are continuing uh, supporting my research and collaborating in a very positive way. I can't thank enough Dr. Hamad al kuwari Professor Hamad, and Professor Fadl Saadouni, their unlimited and continuous support. Of course, Dr. Tomaso, he was the first one who introduced me to the topic. Professor uh, uh, Judith and uh, Professor Baria, not just for being a team, but also for being a family. Thank you. Uh, the department, the, my home, which I got my degrees, um, my master's and PhD, my co-authors, my research colleagues, my students that keep on contributing to this field of research and producing a thesis and posters. Of course, I would uh, last, but at least I would like to thank all the staff in all the research centers of Qatar University for helping us a lot with uh, sample analysis. Thank you all for attending. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Azalfa, for this presentation. I hope I'm not so fast. I was not fast. We have only time, you know, for two questions. Okay. Please, you can start. Sir? Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, I, 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 as you know, in microbial math, I was wondering how significant 
in the mat themselves. I mean, you, your study was mainly based on, on a fuel culture. So I was just trying, wondering how, how significant are aerobic heterotrophs and the EPS in the mat itself. Yeah. Um, and the second question is regarding the EPS. You mentioned the presence of EPS is important. So I was just wondering about the composition or the concentration of EPS. Does that play a role as well? Yeah. Or it's just the presence and absence? Yeah, yeah. This is a very complex question. Nobody, I think, have the answer for that. So we think that microbial activity, regardless of what type of bacteria or uh, organism, all uh, contribute. This is a community that contributes to the formation of uh, carbonate minerals or magnesium incorporation into uh, the carbonate minerals. We specifically would uh, wanted to work on aerobic bacteria, just simplify the system and to know what are, are the rule of uh, the rule of these bacteria. And we studied their uh, microbial activity in addition to uh, uh, the EPS produced. Of course, Professor Nabil tomorrow will also elaborate on the what kind of activities that is being uh, uh, done by this bacteria and the, the role of enzymes like carbon anhydrase. So it, it's a complex system. In my opinion, and from my experience, I think that every, every uh, player is a component in this. Uh, all the EPS that is produced in nature have a role in the incorporation of uh, magnesium because uh, this is the most, yeah, yeah, this is the kinetic barrier for forming uh, dolomite. What is exactly the role of each part, part is still, I think it's a, we can't mimic the complexity of the nature. Also the up by abiotic conditions like uh, temperature, magnesium calcium ratio, uncertainty also plays a major factor. They, they are may, maybe uh, main factor, maybe sometimes more than the, the microbial uh, components. So both, it's a complex. It's a complex. I can't answer the question because we are still doing. But we start, We tried, we are now uh, extracting some of natural EPS, which is in sub, which is, will be a mixture of uh, many, uh, uh, many organisms. And we are trying to apply this natural uh, EPS in, uh, in our precipitation experiments. But it will be also far from uh, Mimicking the complexity of the, the nature, natural uh, environment, yeah. By the way, you know, all speakers, they get to be around. If there is more question or anything like this or details you need, please, you know, you can ask them after 12 because we are limited now with time. Uh, for for the, we're going to start with third speaker. Thank you, Thank Dr. Zalfa so. We're going to start with, anyway, you're going to start with some background for Dr. Rajendran Sankran. Dr. Rajendran is a researcher yep. at Environmental Science Center, Qatar University. He works on several research projects and the applications of remote sensing technique to earth and environmental resources with international universities and research institutions. He has many papers published in the same field. I'm going to switch the mic to him so he can start. Thank you, Doctor. Happy to hear the bell. Uh, good morning to you all. Um, first of all, I thank that uh, organization for accepting that uh, uh, abstract and uh, allowing us to present this work. Uh, People already were discussed more about that the uh, Sabha uh, from the field onwards. Uh, this study is about a little bit related to remote sensing. Uh, we have chosen an area that inland Sabha, which is situated on the west coast. Uh, that is what called that the Dukhan Sabha. Uh, people already spoken about that, the significance of the, the Sabha. I don't want to be of uh, not much on that, but still I want to be of emphasize. Uh, since that the Sabha is very aggressive environment, we may suppose to be of look at that optimal tool to study that the whole area. In the case, the remote sensing, I mean the satellite data is supposed to be of use for to study the uh, Sabha. In this study, we attempted to map that the salinity of uh, Duhan Sabha, uh, mapped using the, the satellite data. Initially, what we did on that, since that the geological formations are related to 
the somehow environment, we use the satellite data, what we call the Astro satellite data, to map the, the different formations of the, the area. And thereafter, we collected samples, and then we studied the, the spectroscopy of the, the minerals, I mean the evaporite minerals, and then associated formations of the carbonate formations. And then we used the spectra of the, the field spectra to the, the satellite data, and then we attempted to be of showing the, the minerals of the subha. And later, we also used the, the another satellite data of, uh, how do I say that the multispectral imager of sentinel two data to study about that the uh, salinity as well as moisture using the data of the year from 2018 to 2020, about three years, by using the, the monthly data. Well, this is the uh, slides it's showing you where the, the distribution of the, the Sakha in the Gulf region, you can see it here. Of course, the whole Qatar of uh, having up the, the Sakha, you can see that, that the right, uh, the Sakha, and then the study area where the Dugan is situated. Uh, the Sakha highlighted in the, the pink in color. And you can, this is the area, the Dugan Sakha, the pink color of the, the uh, Sakha region. And you can see that the other associated formation, I mean the geological formations, the limestone as well as the uh, dolomite, uh, which are all in the uh, rust formation and then the tama formation. And you have some of the, the dotted lines. Those lines are already studied by the, the Dilly et al. And they mentioned as your sulfate lines. And to our right, you have the, the satellite image of Aster little old satellite, but still we can use it for mapping of the, the geology. And you can see that the environment of Sakha, and you can see light brown, those are all the limestone formations, and light bluish color, those are all the sandy uh, dust deposits. And you have some of the, the moisture content, and those are all that representing the, the Sakha. Well, initially to map that the uh, Sakha as well as associated lithological features, we attempted to uh, download that the Astro data and process the uh, Astro data by principal component analysis. If you are looking on the, the principal component image one, you may not be of distinguishing as well the uh, different rock formations. But if you are choosing the, uh, if you are using the uh, principal component two as well as three or four, some of the formations are supposed to be of in bright in color. Some of the formations may be of in the dark in color. And by studying that the spectral absorption and then the reflection of the, the image, we may supposed to be of a, develop a colorful image, false color composite, in which you may supposed to be of able to discriminate the different type of rock types. Uh, for example, if you are looking on that the uh, pink in color, those are all related to the limestone dolomite, and then the dusty storm of the, the eosin deposits are here, and bright yellow are the, the sakha, which are all the, the gypsy ferrite salt caps in the sub environment. Well, we went to the field, we collected the samples, and we measured the, the uh, spectra of the, the samples. And also we measured the um, some of the rock formation samples for the presence of the minerals. And we are able to be of uh, discriminate the absorption characters of all those minerals, because these spectra are supposed to be transposed to do study that the satellite data. And this spectra also we studied with the, the uh, US uh, GS spectral library for minerals for understanding that the spectral absorption of that the minerals. If you are looking that the gypsum minerals, it has that the spectral absorption around 1450. And if that can be of uh, discriminated from that the anhydride as well as halite, which has that the absorption of around 1400. So each minerals, it has that the its own absorption in the wavelength that could be of use for mapping of those minerals in the Sabga region. And you can also see it, the other two minerals, carbonate minerals, calcite as well as dolomite. And you can check that calcite, it has the, the composition of CaCO3. And then the column uh, dolomite, it has the, the composition of CaMgCO3. That the component of the, the Mg, it can be of uh, adding some of the, the absorptions which can be of use to discriminate over the, the satellite data. In addition to the, the field uh, spectral measurement, we also used the, the satellite data 
to study the spectroscopy. Uh, this is the satellite data of Hyperion, little bit old satellite data of the region of uh, um, Duhan Sapa. We extracted the image spectra from that the uh, satellite data, and these spectra were compared with that the previous light spectra that is in the field spectra, understanding that the spectral absorptions and then the reflections, we are able to be of uh, draw that the uh, detect the minerals of the uh, Sabha region. Not only that the Hyperion data, which we I showed in the previous slides, I also attempted to use that the data of Prisma, which is of the uh, Italian Space Agency satellite. If you are looking by side, there are some of that the spectral library plots, and we have included in that the, our field work, uh, field library plots also, and the image spectra of the Prisma. And those are all of comparable with the, the Hyperion data as well as the field data. And this is for the, the Gypsum crest. And this is for the, the halide crest of the Dasapha. And this is the Celsius salt crest of the Dasapha. And understanding all the reflection and then the absorptions, we interpreted, we mapped the, the minerals of the Dasapha. Not that the rock types, we used the, the acid data to discriminate the different rock types. Here, we used the, the um, hyperspectral satellite data to detect the minerals of the sulfur. And you can check it here, the dolomite, calcite, gypsum, halite, how it is distributed in the, the um, what is that, the Duhan Sabha. Since that the path of the, the Hyperion satellite is not fully covered, uh, the Duhan region, and we have chosen that the Prisma data here, and you can check it that there is a, at the top of that the image, you can check that the very bright green, that is at the halide crest. And what you are seeing that the red, uh, that is on the anhydrite crest, as well as uh, you can see it on the, the sipsiferous crest also in the yellow in color. So like that, we can detect the minerals using the, the satellite data too also. Well, understanding these spectral absorption characters, spectroscopy of the, the minerals, we try to be of uh, use the, the different satellite data, that is what we call the, the sentinel tool. Uh, satellite and used that the two different indices. One is for the, the salinity and another one for the, the uh, moisture. And this is the diagram which we have chosen for the, the satellite data of the years 2020 and then uh, 2018, 2019, and 2020 for the three years. Every monthly data we have captured and then uh, we have downloaded, we have processed using the, the uh, indices that is for the, the salinity indices. And here is the band, what are the significant bands supposed to be of choose for the, the map, the salinity. And you can check the gulf, it is of appearing on the, the cyan to blue in color. On the carbonate formations, it is appearing on the, the bright red in color. Between that the bright red, you can see that the subha. Also, you can see that the variation in the salinity. And there are some of the, the uh, how do I say, uh, dotted circles over there. And if you are looking on that the circle from that the April to September, there is a connectivity between the base regret to the subha. It is indirectly telling that one the water would have been fed by from that the regret to subha. And this is the interpretation of the, the previous what I told uh, talk about. And the, this is that the moisture indices image of that the uh, Sentinel two satellite data. And if you are looking at here, the same response that high salinity, high moisture, it has happened during the month of uh, April to the, the August. And you can see that the, there is a connectivity between the Zigrid Bay and then the Sabha, I mean the Dugan Sabha. So, and this uh, presence of the high salinity and the high moisture or depends on the, the arid climate conditions. And we went to the field to validate our the, the remote sensing results, satellite data derived results. And you can check it here that the presence of the dolomite formations, which has the, the dolomite minerals, and then the limestone, limestone formation, which has the, the calcite minerals, and similarly, uh, the other siliceous uh, sand deposits, and the, the vegetation environment of the, the uh, Duhan region, you can see it here, which can be of deduct uh, using the, the satellite data. And this is the typical gypsiferous salt in that area, salt flat, and the soil under that, that you are right side, and here are the, the halide deposits within the, the Dukhan region, 
and where you do have some of the crystallizations, the different environment, even better beautiful figures are shown by Tomaso, Dr. Tomaso. And we have collected these samples in the laboratory. We measured that the spectra able to be of demonstrate that the, uh, uh, the absorption as well as the reflections of that the minerals. Well, these are all the pictures I captured when I was breaking on that the uh, dolomite rock. You can see some of the, the green in color. I'm not sure that uh, you're supposed to be a few people uh, answer to this. And similarly, we have observed some microbials on the, the area. So these are all the field evidences which are which I have used for the, to support the, the remote sensing detection of the minerals in the subha region as well as the rock in the subha region. Ultimately, we collected the sample. We brought to the, the laboratory for the, the under, uh, know that the name, name of the minerals, presence of the minerals. Uh, we did on the, the XRD analysis, and we are able to be of uh, uh, prove that the uh, soils have that the gypsum and then halite as well as anhydrite and then the carbonate formation, which has that the uh, dolomite as well as uh, calcite, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all the minerals. And these are all the. Uh, for, moreover. Uh, with the collector sample, I mean the soil sample, we analyze for the, the salinity, electrical conductivity, as well as TDS and then pH, and then compare these results with the, the image results, uh, uh, which show that the, the high salinity in that sub region. And these are the variation plot uh, represent the previous data and showing that the very high uh, salinity in that the sub area. Of course, uh, as I mentioned here, uh, the sub is under an aggressive environment due to the occurrence of saline soil and brines in around the salt crust and salt flats. Well, to conclusions, uh, we are able to be a map that the uh, different type of rock types in and around the subha using the, the acid data, and as well as we are able to be a study the spectroscopy of the minerals, which are all on the uh, subha region using the, the BMA spectroradiometer as well as Hyprian, as well as the Prisma spectrometer data, and then we are able to be of analyze the um, Sentinel-2 data for the years of 2018 to 2020 and be able to show that the moisture as well as the uh, salinity by using the, the indices. And then, well, uh, the field study also, uh, we are able to be of uh, integrate with the field study, which is able to be of uh, provide that the support to that the uh, satellite data results. Well, I believe that uh, this spectroscopy uh, results supposed to be of used for that the uh, like uh, prism, uh, which is on that the imaging spectrometer for that the MOS, maybe in the future mission of the close-up imager of uh, exos MOS, uh, and the results supposed to be of integrated and can be of study for that the an analog of for that the MOS. Thank you. And these are all that the satellite data which I have used. And uh, here is a publication. We have a piece of work we published on the, the science of the total of environment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajendran, for your presentation. Actually, we are, as I said before, you know, we are limited with time. We have only, you know, chance for one question. Thank you again. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I, I always have a, an issue because it's technologically very challenging what you're doing and geology is notoriously unreliable. So how do you deal with the uh, limestone or dolostone which is covered by three centimeters of siliciclastic eolian sand? Your data would show eolian sand, isn't it? It cannot look through this surface layer. Remote sensing is the surface level Thank 
Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Rajendra. Our next presentation is going to be the last for our speaker, Professor George McKenzie. She is a professor of geology from Geological Institute, Department of Earth Science, Swiss, Federal Institute of Technology, Zurich. Her doctoral thesis submitted in 1976, and the title is Isotope Study of the Hydrology and Coexisting Carbonate Phases from Site of Recent Dolomization, the Coastal Spacha of Abu Dhabi Persian Gulf. She worked as a researcher in the University of Florida uh, as ETH researcher. And in Florida, she made research of geochemical, which is work on carbonate. Uh, the research was on dolomites. In 1987, she went back to Switzerland and continued to work on the same field. In 1996, promoted to professor of geology, earth system sciences. After all of that experience and the travel, she still and continue, you know, to work on modern dolomites and development of geomicrobiology. I there are a lot of information actually, you know, but I prefer to keep the time you know, for presentation. We have to change the computer. Too. Yeah, sure. And we need time, you know, for that too. Thank you for the introduction. It's very kind. Very happy to be here. It's very nice to see all of my old colleagues who have worked on SOPCAS over the years with me. Um, indeed, I did my field work in Abu Dhabi in 1973. That's 50, 50 years ago. We geologists like geological time, right? <laughs> 50 years ago is the dark ages. <laughs> it's the dark ages of scientific research in the Sopkis. And what I wanted to do today is I wanted to go back and look at how we've, the things we've learned with time and how it's changed our thinking. And of course, we have all these most recent studies that are being reported at this wonderful conference here. But I wanted to show how important the SOPCAs have been in the development of our, of our, our of time. And so my title is SOPCAs of Qatar, but in reality, I'm going to be talking about the SOPCAs of Abu Dhabi. Because, and I want to explain to you why things moved to Abu Dhabi at that time in the early 70s. And um, that's just a little bit about what dolomite is. It was discovered by this wonderful man, Deodati Dolomieu. He wrote a paper in 19, 1791. Now that is prehistory. <laughs> and his paper was titled on a type of calcareous rock that reacts slightly with acid and that phosphoresces in on being struck with a hammer. Okay. This is still a method that we use to identify dolomite when we go in. We use a weak acid. If it fizzes, it's calcite. If it doesn't fizz, it's dolomite. So he gave us our methodology very early. And um, dolomite has been a problem uh, that was identified in the early 1900s um, because of the lack of modern dolomite um, it, analogs 
to explain its abundance in the geological record. And as we go back in geological time, we have more and more dolomite. As we come forward, very little, and very little of it exists today is forming. It's extremely rare. So that was the, the initial thing about the dolomite problem. And the second aspect was that dolomite does not precipitate from modern seawater. So if we have all this dolomite in the rock record, how did it ever precipitate? Well, that has been, we have since um, the 1970s, and particularly beginning with the, the discovery of dolomite in the Sopkas of, of, of Qatar, uh, the paper by Ealings, Wells, and Taylor, 1965, is the one that I usually quote. Um, we recognize that we did have dolomite forming in modern environments. We found it in the Kurang Lagoons of South Australia. In, in the Bahamas, it was identified forming a, a dolomitic crust in the Bahamas, and also through ocean drilling. Drilling into deep sea sediments, we did recognize that we had dolomite forming. And I think this is really important com contributions, but how we studied dolomite in this comparative modern environment in the Sopkis was the title, the object of my thesis. And if you, if you see here, I, I don't know if I have a point. Is this a pointer? It's not working. OK, well, we can see this. The areas uh, uh, that I did my studies is what's called the Kinsman area, because Kinsman actually had mapped out this area of the Sopka. And here is Abu Dhabi and Evans Line. And so I took samples and studied the pore water geochemistry and the sediments in that area, Kinsman area, and along the Evans Line. Um, we use the word Persian Gulf, but I kept that in my thesis title, because that's how we expressed it at the time. I would now never use that. I would always say Arabian Gulf, <laughs> yeah. But that was the, that we're talking about 50 years ago. And uh, you can see the beautiful area that was just undeveloped, totally undeveloped. And here are these beautiful, and we've seen some pictures before of the, the microbial mass along the vast expanses, and the Sopka itself. And I put, I like this picture because it shows how did they really discover what was below the Sopka? They drove over it, and then suddenly they had to dig their tires out. <laughs> and so they started digging into the Sopka, and that's when they recognized they have this very fantastic sequence of carbonate and sulfate sediments. And here is uh, just digging into the modern microbial math. We've seen pictures of this earlier in earlier talks, very finely laminated, beautiful, beautiful sequences, modern sequences, of what we find in the rock record, or we identify with the rock record. Now, you would have noticed <laughs> uh, uh, how we did the field work in those days is we dug trenches. I mean, <laughs> we, we weren't just putting little holes into the Sopka. We were digging major, hole, major trenches. And this is my uh, uh, field assistant. Many of you know him. His name is Helmut Weiser. He's a really well-known. Um, a geochemist who has worked in the Cretaceous Jurassic sediments. And we had helpers in the field. And um, so we dug these holes because we really wanted to understand the stratigraphy. And here is an up close up of it. You know, you have the, the carbonate and then gypsum. And what was really important and what fascinated the geologists at that time well, okay, here's a buried microbial mat. But Dolomite was forming. We had pure dolomite crystals forming, growing around aragonite crystals. We identified these. And here I nicely show, I think this is a very interesting, how the top picture is very close to the coast. We have very tiny crystals. These crystals in the middle part of the Sopka are growing. And those in the back part are even larger. So are we precipitating then? The crystals, are, are they growing larger with time in the sediment? And this is the, uh, the picture that I showed before of crystals growing around aragonite crystals. But what was fascinating to the geologists at that time is you notice that white layer at the top? That's anhydrite. Massive anhydrite in the in more interior part of the Sopka. And why was that fascinating to, and particularly oil company geologists who were working in the field in that area, and it's because simply that the, the Abu Dhabi coastal Sapka, the facies, is very similar to what you might see in a Permian evaporating sequence, where you have the gypsum, the anhydrite, and the dolomite. So it's this, this association of these very important minerals 
in these Permian evaporites that led to fascination in this modern environment and how to study the, this modern sequence. Okay, this is Abu Dhabi in 1973. Do you recognize it? <laughs> it's a completely different world. And um, uh, this is the era, I mean, it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating to work there. And again, the areas off the, this is the Abu Dhabi Island, so coming off the island on the Sapka along the coast, it working in there, going from the coastal Sapka, interior Sapka, into the vast interiors of the Sapka. We studied the poor water geochemistry and the sediments of this area. And my thesis was to look at the stable isotopes of the poor water geochemistry, identify what the water, where, what was the source of the water, and how it was related to the minerals, the carbonate minerals. So what we were able to show, you have the coast, you have these lagoons, you have the re marine recharge with the flooding of the Sopka during these major Shamal wind events, and you have rain. Actually, I, has, I have to say, I never saw rain ever until this week. <laughs> I, I was so impressed with the amount of rain that was falling this week. Uh, so we do know that we have rain recharge. And we have normal horizontal. Um, so the recharge from marines and the meteoric water, and you have a natural uh, hydrological flow. And our study then, through isotopes, um, we, we came to the conclusion we had the recharge, but we have evaporation and upward movement. This was important, this upward movement. It's called evaporative pumping. And that was the, um, my, my, my major thesis advisor was Ken Shu, Professor Ken Shu, and he had this idea that we had vertical migration of water, not just horizontal. And so we were testing his idea in the field. And we did come up with a hydrological model. I don't know how, how good it is till today, but uh, it did seem to work based on the data that we collected. So we have the flooding recharge of the system, we have this transitory hydrostatic state, and then we have the, what he called evaporative pumping. And so in other words, you don't just move the water horizontally through the Sopka, but you're moving it upward, and you're evaporating it, and so you're getting these highly evaporated waters. So that was our hydrological model, and um, it seemed to fit very nicely. We found the dolomite, the dolomite was um, in the isotopic equilibrium with these poor waters that we were looking at. We had this gypsum, and on top of that, we had the anhydrite and buried microbial mats within the sediments. We were not thinking at all about organic matter. In fact, I've been discussing this with some of my colleagues the last two days. We got rid of the organic matter. We would um, oxidize it away using peroxide or some kind of a special solution, like uh, uh, just to get rid of it. So we never saw this um, this uh, EPS, but we're going to come back to that. And that is simply okay. So we developed a stratigraphy. We have um, uh, supertidal phases, upper intertidal, lower intertidal, and it. I, I'm sure it still is actual today. It has not, that has not changed. It's how we look at the sediments. And we had then um, this upward movement, this testing this idea of evaporative pumping. So we're back to the dolomite problem again. We've solved it. We, dolomite does precipitate from modern seawater, but we were never able to precipitate dolomite in the laboratory under Earth's surface conditions. You could do it at high temperatures, but not under Earth's surface conditions. And this brings me to my colleague who's sitting up here in the audience who is going to give you some of his presentations, Cusagono Vasconcelos, and a, a colleague of ours, a microbiologist. They worked together, and in 1995, they were able to produce a ferrous dolomite in the laboratory using water from a lagoon in Brazil where dolomite is precipitating, and using the mixed culture, the bacterial mixed culture, they were able to precipitate a dolomite. A microbial mediation as a possible mechanism for natural dolomite formation at low temperatures. Yeah, that solves our problem, right? <laughs> the second aspect. So going back, then this is the area where the water comes from, the Lago Vermelha area in Brazil. But going back to the, uh, to, uh, the Sapcas, so with Tommaso Bontinelli, 
we went back, we revisited in 2004, coming more closer to, to modern times. Uh, uh, we went, decided to return to the Sapkas of Abu Dhabi that time with Christian Strohmenger was able, he facilitated so, uh, our return to the Sapkas of Abu Dhabi. So we revisited and we asked the question, is this a microbial world? We started thinking very, very different about microbes at this time in 2004. Of course, we couldn't go back to the original Sapka. <laughs> it just is not there. <laughs> in fact, I think my thesis, if you wanted to go back and see if I was really correct, it's somewhere underneath the international airport or somewhere like that. It's just, it's just not there. And here, um, the team, it, here's Abu Dhabi 2004, a picture from Abu Dhabi in 2004, and the new team, Tommaso Bontagnelli and Chris Algano, and our microbiologist, Rolf Wortman, who worked together um, so here's my original area, and this is what it looks like today or, or in 2004. And uh, through the, we were able to then move our sites uh, where we were investigating um, up along the coast away. And Christian Strohmanger was very, very helpful in identifying where we could do. And we had a, did a transect, uh, you can see in that area, the study area. And I think it's still available. People can still go go there. But we're doing very different kinds of research on this hub canal. We're not digging holes or trenches. We're putting in pores. And we're doing the field work and the laboratory work right there in the field. I mean, it was just, it was phenomenal to see how technology and how our approach to studying the South Coast was very different in 2004 than in 1973. And so we, uh, this, this is Tommaso Bontagnelli's. Actually, you should talk about this, Tommaso. But we did a transect, one near the coast, uh, one more in the upper intertidal, and then one in the supertidal. And you can see the mat is at the surface. It's been buried, and it's been buried much deeper. And so what we wanted to look at is the transition from the coast to the interior and how it might change and the formation of dolomite. And I, I think this is something I remember, Tommaso, when you first, the first time you looked under a microscope and you saw these spheres, remember? We recognized those spheres. That's dolomite. And that's dolomite that's like these dolomitic spheres in this EPS. We also then um, uh, found that we had a new strain of, of sulfate-reducing bacteria that was isolated from the mats. And that bacteria is genetically very similar to Desulfovibrio brasilensis. Brasilensis, it's a bacteria that we identified genomically from Brazil. So there is a very close similarity between the microbial community in the Sopcas and what you would find in these lagoons in Brazil. Okay, so where do we go from here? Well, just to give you, this would, would have been, remember, I remember that day, we were in the lab, and what is that? What are those? Well, there you have it. There are small spheres of dolomite forming within the EPS. That is the EPS. And you see the EPS. So is extrasolute polymetric substance the EPS? Is that the clue? Is that the answer to the dolomite problem? Uh, this just nicely shows when you go from higher magnification, the crystals, you can see the spheres that are growing within these dolomite crystals. Crystals are larger, and they come together to form these spheres in, in the microbial mats themselves. Now, what I wanted to say here is that then this is how we looked at and this is what we see now. And that's simply because we got rid of the organic matter in our samples. We didn't want to analyze organic matter. So the, the difference, but it is the same. It probably is the same. But we look at the EPS now, and it's really important. Um, so that came, brings me to my final question. But are microbes the solution to the dolomite problem? Do we need that microbes to make dolomite? This is something, this is a question we're still working on and still trying to answer. I would probably say we have a whole spectrum of things. You do need it in certain cases, that works in certain cases, but you can make dolomite maybe some. There's other ways to make dolomite. But I think for the wide expanses of dolomite that we see in the rock record, 
like the Haupt Dolomite in, in, in the Alps, for example, they are associated with microbial um, processes. Which then brings me towards the end of my talk, and I, I love this. Uh, Fadil Saduni is one of the co-authors on this paper. I don't have his name there, but I love this cartoon. What he said, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. Then a miracle occurs. What is that miracle? Well, some miracle ingredients that we've learned by studying the sakas. Earth's surface temperature is important. 38 degrees centigrade is the microbial optimum. Time seems to be essential. Given enough time, the, the, the dolomite will precipitate. The more time, the better. And solution chemistry. Evaporative conditions seem to be very, very important, and particularly for the, the microbes that are living in these environments. So microbes as geological agents in the sedimentary equation, OK. There is a quote out of this paper, Padil, where is Padil <laughs> up there? Uh, it says, once geoscientists understand how dolomite forms in a controlled environment, they may come closer to learning how it forms in nature and why it was so once so prevalent and as yet is so uncommon today. And I think that what I want to emphasize with this is we need to protect the Qatar, the Sapkas of Qatar, or the Qatari Sapkas. This is our controlled environment. This is where we can actually go and study these processes. And using new technology, when you look what I did in the Dark Ages and what Tommaso did you know, in the early 2000s, it, it, it has been essential to have this environment in its pure state. And we have already proposed at another time that maybe these should be geoparks, the study of dolomite precipitation and microbial mats colonizing the Qatari sediments is so, so important to our understanding of how dolomite forms. So I want to give a heads up to this guy, Jean Chin. I don't know, uh, uh, Professor Hamid mentioned it earlier this morning, but uh, if you read this book, he was, he was living in Qatar in the 60s. He loved it here. He brought his family to stay here with him. And uh, he, he, what he writes about that time and his, the explorations of the Sap, Sapkas is so important. But he did write uh, in the book, on page 249, he wrote, in 2005, he went back to a site in Qatar where the mineral dolomite forms milky precipitates in brine groundwater exposed in a shallow pit. Geochemists rejected the notion that dolomite can actually precipitate directly from water. OK, Peter Swart reminded me that there was a, a publication, a, G, a GSA abstract, dealing with this spontaneous precipitation of dolomites in pines from the Umsad Sabka of Qatar. OK, this has happened. How do we study this? How can we evaluate this? This is essentially a reason to reserve, protect the Qatars, Qatari Sapkas. And I can't emphasize that, you know, coming from my past, looking to what Tommaso, what recent with uh, Sulfa people have been studying, what we're learning from these Sapkas, if we didn't have them in their natural state, our laboratory is gone. It's essential. So I thank you. But before I want to say for, for, for your attention, I just want to add one thing. Maria Dietrich and I on Saturday visited, oh, and visited the National Museum of Qatar. I couldn't believe what I saw written on the wall. Everyone shares the responsibility to safeguard Qatar's natural world for generations to come. And by generations, I think science, our science, our geological, our geochemical, our geomicrobiological bi generations to come, we need to preserve these sapkas. So I wanted to leave you with this message. Thank you very much, okay. Prof. McKenzie, for all of these information and really interesting presentation. And really, I am as Qatar, you know, I feel proud and happy to see all of that work, you know, on our land. Thank you again for this, and thank you for everyone, you know, support you here and works with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And I think I'm right on time for lunch. You are wonderful, actually. <laughs> okay. But I like to say, you know, I like to thank everyone, all speakers, and really we are happy, you know, to be with you today. At the same time, I like to remind you, you know, uh, we have another session. It's going to start like one o'clock, and they're going to give you, you know, for break for lunch, and see you inshallah next session. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I enjoyed talking to you ah, <laughs> sitting in the front row. Thank you. Well. <laughs> yeah. By the way, they're going to be around. If you have any question or you need more information. It's over. <laughs> well, now because I wanted to be on time. <laughs> so. Now may proceed to the next panel discussion, but let me, before this, uh, just have some refreshments. You have two minutes, right? Uh, one minute, half? Okay. Uh, so before we start to the next panel discussion, I want just to address uh, just general knowledge about the word sabha, since this is like the, the key word of this whole um, conference. Uh, just acute knowledge or information that sabha actually is the word in fusha, sabha or sabha. In Qatari, we say sabha. In English, I've heard like some pronunciation that sabha, because thank you that you are trying hard, but the ha sound is not appearing. So, just a tip, kha is the sound that comes up of the throat. It's kha, kha. Yeah, so let's try to have this homework during the conference to try to pronunciation at least, sab kha. Sab kha. Yes, exactly, you're getting it, okay? Let's have this homework. Okay, excellent. <laughs> yes, good for you. Now, going from the first panel discussion, which was, thank you, from the first panel discussion, which was a general overview over Sbukha in Qatar, going through exploring the role of microbially produced organic molecules to silently and temporary stability of the inland Sabha of the state of Qatar to the end of the coastal Sabha of Qatar. But during these three speakers, we've heard one word that kept repeating. <clears throat> what is the word? Yes, dolomite. Exactly. And dolomite now, we're going to know much, much more about it in this, the second panel discussion. So to open up the second without any further, let's please welcome the moderator, Mr. P.J. Moore, to open the panel discussion of Dolomite problem. Please welcome. Hello, everyone. I hope you had a good lunch. I really enjoyed it, and I want to thank the conveners for putting together a, a really nice meal. And for those of you for your first time or it's been a long time, it was really well done. My name is PJ Moore. I work at ExxonMobil Research Qatar. I've been here for about two years. And I, for those of you that used to work with either Jerry Jameson or Christian Strominger, as well as John Rivers, I'm now in that role that they were in. And I come from a little bit of a different background because as opposed to looking just at the rocks, my focus primarily was geochemistry and the absence of carbonate rocks, which was karst and the, the, the development of caves and that and that like. But one of the things I'd really like to point out is that for me, this session is a bit of an honor because of some of the people that are in it. And when I was a, an undergraduate, years and years and years ago, I read this book, Carbonate Sedimentology. And to be able to finally put you know, a face to a name and then to be able to meet, and I haven't met officially, but to meet Peter and you know, working with John Martin at the University of Florida for my dissertation, I've read more of your papers than I want to, and there's a part of me that wants to hit you and a part of me that wants to hug you. So uh, that's a North American term of endearment. Um, 
Peter's been fantastic with the wealth that he's provided of his knowledge in geochemistry. And uh, Professor Tucker has been fantastic with the work that he's provided over the years. And so I'm really honored to be able to, to chair this session. Without further ado, I would like to open up the first talk, our keynote is Maurice Tucker, and he's going to talk about dolomites. Is there a problem or is there not? Thank you. Turn this off. Yeah, but it doesn't work. Something to the screen. Okay. Okay. Well, um, good afternoon. And, um, uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to come here to Doha to give this talk. Um, it's always uh, a pleasure to come to the Middle East, especially to Qatar. I uh, came here last in uh, 2014 as part of a project with ExxonMobil and uh, Jerry Jameson and Christine Schraumenger, who had a project on Sabcha, is how I would pronounce it, Sabcha, but I'm a bit reluctant to use the word now. Um, anyway, so, uh, um, okay, so you know what I'm going to talk about. And what I would say is that um, uh, we've heard from Judy about the discovery of Dolomite back in 1791 and the first paper published on Dolomite by De Dolomieu. In 1991, those of us that uh, um, enjoy looking at Dolomites, we had a meeting in the Dolomites to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the discovery of Dolomite. And then, um, short of a party, we decided to have another celebration of Dolomite back in uh, 2016, which was the 225th anniversary of the discovery of Dolomite. And um, back in 2016, I gave a, a keynote address on the trouble with Dolomite. Where are we? So um, to be invited to give another address on Dolomite, I, I thought, well, I've done it once. Um, what's changed in the last six years? So basically, that's what I thought I would look at. Um, what's been discovered? What, what's thought of as new, or what are the new popular models um, in uh, the origin of Dolomite. So that's what I thought I would uh, talk about. That's my slide from 2016. But um, uh, just in case you're not absolutely familiar with the issues about uh, the Dolomite problem, uh, here you can see, again, this is the slide from 2016. But actually, it's the slide from when I was giving lectures back in the 19. 80s, so it's a very old um, slide, but updated a little bit. But the top right, you can see in blue there, a typical slide from the 1980s, where I give you the factors controlling dolomite precipitation, as we knew then. One thing I would just point out, it says they're lower sulfate, and we know that nowadays that's not quite such an important factor. And the last thing there, organic influences. Back in the 1980s, talking about dolomite, I'd always say, well, if you don't understand dolomite, we can always blame the bacteria. So I think that's where we are now. We're still blaming the bacteria. Anyway, you can see from the stuff written there on the left, dolomite's still a bit of a controversy, perhaps. Um, the problem is, how do they form? What, what models do we use, et cetera? Difficult to study experimentally, difficult to make in the lab. That's what we said. Uh, there are very few modern occurrences. We don't see much of it today. Um, uneven distribution through time, more in the Precambrian. Seawater supersaturated with regards to dolomite, but it doesn't precipitate there. And then the argument of is it primary dolomite or not? And then you need a source of magnesium. Well, we're very happy now that it's seawater for the most part. And you've got a, some, you need some mechanism of transporting the fluids through the sediments. So that was from the 1980s. That's how I began my talk six years ago. Now where are we? What have we learned since 2016? So I've spent the last two weeks looking at all the literature on dolomite. 
Um, and I reckon I've looked at about 100 papers that, that jumped out at me from the mainline journals and some others in more obscure journals. And I reckon that probably between up to about 20 were um, useful in terms of forwarding our understanding of uh, dolomite. Uh, some were case studies, so that, that's OK, and didn't have much new to offer. But uh, so there are a few things which I want to bring to your attention um, in connection with where we are now with dolomite. OK, so um, different aspects of dolomite. But of course, you've got to remember, there are many different types of dolomite. And they're not all a real problem. It's only some types of dolomite, you could say, where there are the real issues. So I can just say, talk about the new ideas that, um, or the old ideas that have come back into fashion. I uh, mentioned a bit about uh, dolomite itself, dolomite uh, stoichiometry and ordering. Uh, when is a calcium magnesium carbonate dolomite? Uh, we'll talk about microbial of dolomite, of course. That's in a sense, that's why we're here. Um, and then the dolomitization of limestone. Is that separate or is that part of the same microbial dolomite story? And there are some other things which I could mention. Uh, dolomites through time, burial dolomites and modeling of dolomites. I think that's not quite such much of a problem. And then I've got to finish with viruses, haven't I? Um, OK, so just very quickly, um, just to give you an example of one dolomite formation, to illustrate that dolomite is a whole range of different things, a lot of different animals. I've done quite a bit of work on the Permian, the Zechstein, major oil reservoir in the North Sea, very similar reservoir rocks, rocks to the ones you have here in Qatar, just offshore in your north field and, and your, um, your main gas reservoir, which we're very grateful to in England. We like your gas. And um, uh, this... Permian Zechstein Reservoir in Britain is um, a typical dolomite reservoir. We have dolomite there with a whole range of different origins, different types of dolomite, as you can see written there in those, uh, yeah, those five, four points there. Um, it's a typical dolomite evaporite association. We have carbonate platforms interbedded with gypsum and hydrite. There's a lot of halite present too. Um, OK, so one thing I just point out in my list of uh, possible uh, ways in which my dolomite formed, I don't have a mixing zone. We'll come back to that. OK, so here we have microbial dolomites from the upper Permian in the, in the North Sea Basin. You can see stromatolites, very nice, fine-grained microbial uh, dolomites. You can see relics of EPS there on the right. The isotopes fit in as well with a, um, a, a sin-sedimentary seawater origin. We have badly dolomitized rocks as well. Grainstones, top right, bottom right. Uh, oolites, that's one of the major reservoirs. Um, dolomitized different ways, huge ROMs in some cases, mimetic replacement in others. Uh, we also have um, recrystallization of this dolomite, top left. We also have deep uh, burial dolomite, baroque dolomite, in, in um, veins and fractures during burial with the very negative oxygen isotope that we expect, down to minus 14. Um, and then, a uh, lot of work over the years, we can put together a burial diagenesis map Top left, and you can see the red for the dolomite, near surface dolomite, dolomite recrystallization during burial, and burial dolomites as well. Uh, the isotope story is there, and that is, I think, a good example of a typical limestone formation that's been largely dolomitized by these different types of dolomitization mechanisms. So, um, so now, how have things changed in the last few years? Well, we have our dolomitization models, as we've always had. Uh, here's a diagram from, um, the, you may know I wrote a book called Sedimentary Petrology. It's just about to come out in its 
fourth edition. So here's a, a diagram from there. Um, the only difference really is it's a bit more colorful than the diagrams used to be. Nevertheless, you can see we have our seawater dolomitization, bit of evaporation models up there, the top two. And then over on the left, we have our mixing zone dolomitization model. But the mixing zone, of course, has been out of fashion. And so that mixing zone model there, see, is um, more that the mixing zone is driving the circulation of seawater. Burial, that's fine. And then over on the right, you have a diagram summarizing the different types of seawater dolomitization. OK, so that's just the introduction. Now, what, what about the papers of the last few years? Well, there have been a couple of papers um, emphasizing that dolomite, dolomite can be formed simply by seawater. Seawater that's pretty much like it is, or it's evaporated a little bit. So two papers, um, 2020, 2021, one dealing with Qatar, so it's useful to mention this paper by the group from ExxonMobil here, talking about near normal um, seawater, marine water, dolomitizing your um, eocene, paleocene carbonates. And another paper on the right there, Again, mesohaline, more or less seawater, dolomitization. This paper, uh, Juan Carlos Lea, one of my former students, and I notice my name is there, and um, uh, describing the same sort of thing for very young dolomites, dolomites, pliocene, miocene from the Caribbean, from Bonaire. So um, these two are really re emphasizing the model which we know for circulating seawater or seawater, which has been evaporated just a little. So these Eocene, Paleocene carbonates from Qatar and Saudi, you see them outcropping around the city here in Doha, right next to our hotel. There's a lovely outcrop of the um, demand formation where you can see the outcrops. But here are some from Saudi. Um, this outcrop, uh, these, these uh, Eocene carbonates have been looked at in great detail by um, Ryan Kashmarak and, and uh, John Rivers. And you can see their variety of textures here on the left. And their evidence is that the dolomite came to extremely early. You have different types of dolomite texture. When you look at the isotopes and the trace elements, they are suggesting seawater dolomitization. In other words, you look at the oxygen, it's all fairly close to zero, slightly negative. If you look at the carbon, there's nothing really special about it. Again, it's around zero, minus one. Typical marine values. So the conclusion is this is an example of seawater dolomitization, maybe a little bit evaporated, enough to make the seawater reflux through the carbonate platform. So the interesting thing, though, I thought, well, I'm somebody who believes in microbes. So I thought, um, I'll check these two papers, this um, one on uh, Qatar and the one on Bonaire. What do, they, what do they say about microbes being involved? In other words, we all know that seawater is full of magnesium, but mostly the magnesium in seawater is hydrated. If you want to make dolomite, you've got to dehydrate, desolvate the magnesium. The curious thing was that in both of those papers, which I'm saying they're championing uh, seawater dolomitization, neither of them mentioned microbial. In other words, you wonder, since we said at the very beginning, dolomite doesn't precipitate from seawater, how come they're talking about seawater dolomitization without talking about the dehydration of magnesium? Well, I'm glad that uh, John's not here. Or <laughs> but anyway. And I was an author on one of these papers, and I can't really quite understand why we didn't write a paragraph on that point. Anyway, we'll come back to that sort of thing in a minute. Um, so here, another a couple of papers on seawater dolomitization, looking at island uh, dollar stones, some useful papers from Brian Jones and his group. And I have to mention the Bahamas, because people have been talking about the, the dolomitized dolomites beneath the Bahamas platform for quite some years, um, and of course, Peter's going to tell us more about it. But I highlight that paper because it's one with a new approach to understanding dolomites. We have a, um, a whole 
bunch of isotope measurements there, plus the clumped isotopes, which are contributing to understanding how it's seawater that's doing the dolomitization, plus or minus some mixing with uh, fresh water or with the influence of some evaporated seawater. But nevertheless, uh, we'll be hearing from Peter a little bit later about the latest um, discoveries there. So, seawater dolomitization back in fashion. Um, but we've also had the resurrection of the mixing zone dolomitization um, process. Uh, the mixing zone was very popular back in the 80s, um, all to do with the dissolution of calcite aragonite, the precipitation of dolomite, all related to the mixing of two waters, fresh and, and uh, sea, and uh, changes in the saturation state as you mix those fluids. But people quickly realized that this didn't really work. Very few mixing zones have any dolomite being formed in them. They're more zones where dissolution is taking place. So the mixing zone idea itself sort of fell out of fashion. But it came back in a bit when people realized that um, the mixing zone moves. It moves with sea level change, climate. It moves year to year, seasons, all that sort of thing. And that's a way of moving seawater through shallow water, shallow marine carbonates. Therefore, maybe the mixing zone itself is not where the rocks are being dolomitized. Maybe it's the seawater, which, of course, goes back to the first bit of a story that I gave you. But now we realize that the mixing zone is full of microbes, full of EPS. There's a biosphere down there. All these shallow water fluids, waters, they're full of microbes. So now we have the uh, mixing zone model for dolomitization resurrected here on the right, but now with um, more consideration to the microbial processes that are taking place in terms of changing redox, in, in terms of production of carbonate and um, uh, the, the effects of certain uh, compounds and metals even catalyzing dolomite precipitation. So mixing zone model, back in fashion, but um, a little bit different in terms of now bringing in the biosphere. Um, of course, the next question will be how you recognize mixing zone dolomites from others, but that's a story I'll have to leave. Um, so, but the point I want to make now is that almost any water, anywhere near the surface, is going to be full of microbes, bacteria, viruses, EPS. And I think we've only realized that in the last few years. Some people say we knew it all the time. But nevertheless, I think we've missed out in considering the fact that this biosphere exists. Um, I mean, as I think those two papers on seawater dolomitization didn't discuss it, but I think they should have done. Anyway, so I just, um, from Australia, it seems, they, everybody there knows about the stygo fauna and the fact that um, the groundwater is stuffed full of microbes and tiny, tiny animals. These creatures here on the left are one or two millimeters in size. The groundwater is full of animals and bacteria living there. So where there's life, there's bacteria. Where there are bacteria, there are viruses. OK, so just to show this, um, dolocretes, a type of soil um, forming at the groundwater table in many cases, there's abundant evidence that dolocretes were being formed as a result of EPS and bacteria living down there at that capillary fringe or down in the groundwater table. Paper here from Caroline Mather from 2019, and there's another one coming out soon on the microbial contribution, let's say, to dolocrete. So it's another aspect of this groundwater biosphere uh, producing dolomite and having a major effect on carbonate diagenesis. So over the last half dozen years, basically since 2015, uh, when a paper was published, an infamous meeting at Edinburgh of the Bathurst uh, group, um, then uh, people have been wondering, well, 
exactly what is dolomite? When does dolomite form? Is very high magnesium calcite really dolomite? And there's all this issue of um, if something is 50-50 calcium, magnesium, carbonate, is that dolomite or is it only dolomite if you get ordering reflections? Have you got cation ordering in dolomite? So um, here's a very nice diagram here on the right uh, showing the ordering down as the vertical axis, stoichiometry across as the horizontal axis, and you can see increasing magnesium content. And here, with this suggestion, this is uh, from 2022, last year, you can see we have this sort of dolomite for everything that is um, approaching 50-50 uh, magnesium calcium carbonate. I would suggest we stick with very high magnesium calcite for that totally disordered 50-50 calcium magnesium carbonate. And we start to use the word dolomite when we start to see some ordering peaks. So this ordered dolomite, poor, without any really, poorly ordered dolomite, ordered dolomite, and the well-ordered dolomite. Because actually, if you look at um, ancient dolomites, and here's a, a nice example from the Carboniferous, um, an ancient paper, when you think about it, look how old this paper is, but never mind. We have uh, microbial dolomites here. At the top right, you have dolomitized oolites, and you have burial dolomites, baroque. And what we see in the ordering here on the left side, you can see the ordering increases very nicely. They're all dolomites, but you see the ordering goes from about 0.3 up to 1. So why don't we have some divisions there? Why don't we have something like this, this describing dolomites as poorly ordered, ordered, and well-ordered? Let's try and make it a little bit more scientific, a case for having different categories of ordering, a little bit better we find. OK, so this takes us up to dolomite recrystallization. As I said at the beginning, beginning with my Permian dolomites, we've always thought of dolomite recrystallization taking place with depth. You, the, you, as you bury the rock, so it recrystallizes, get coarser, and so on. But we have a very nice example. This is 2022, last year. Again, from the group from um, ExxonMobil here in Qatar, um, saying that these Eocene, Paleocene do dolomites here in Qatar are recrystallized, but they've never been buried. If you look, burial depths down to 140 meters, that's not very deep. One always imagines recrystallization of dolomites taking place down to maybe 500, 1,000 meters. But no, here it's taking place at very shallow depths. So in other words, recrystallization of dolomite can take place at very shallow depths. And that's borne out by the, uh, the isotopes. The isotopes are not very negative. You may remember, right at the beginning, I pointed out um, the negative isotopes in my Permian, which um, may indicate burial. But here, you have recrystallized dolomites with not far off um, marine um, isotope values. OK. Um, now, let's talk about uh, experimental production of dolomites for a minute, um, dolomitization in terms of stoichiometry and ordering. So this is uh, a paper from um, 2017, um, dolomitizing aragonite ooids. The idea of this was to see how long it might take, what stages might the dolomite go through from aragonite to dolomite. So here, these are high temperature experiments between like 150 and over 200 degrees. Um, so as you gradually develop dolomite with the right uh, fluids there, you can see that the stoichiometry increases through time as the temperature goes up. You can see over here the ordering increases through time with the um, temperature going up. And the, the two stoichiometry, 50-50, trying to reach dolomite against the ordering, increases um, in parallel. So they show that you have a period of induction. Temperature is rising, um, needs some time. And then we have very high magnesium calcite growing on the 
sloping line at the expense of aragonite, and then we reach near stoichiometric, and then stoichiometric. So the pattern of dolomitization is taking time, and uh, we pass through these intermediate phases. Okay, so that's uh, significant. And then, following this further, there have been some more experiments where they actually try to tie down the rates at which dolomite formed from the calcite or aragonite precursor. So this paper, 2019, Kellen Duviston, Verstein there, um, showed that uh, with rising temperature, you can actually get some um, idea of the rate at which the dolomitization was taking place to produce stoichiometric cation-ordered dolomite. And they came up with this, these figures here. Depending on the temperature, um, 50 degrees temperature, the experiments, they back calculated it would take one and a half million years. But if the temperature was down to 25, then uh, it would be more like seven million years for a, um, an aragonite or calcite precursor to be dolomitized. So that's useful to know because it really goes to show you need a lot of time for proper dolomite to form. In other words, when you think about why haven't we got any dolomite forming today? Well, as we will know, we might have the precursors to dolomite. But why doesn't it form today? You need a long time for the ordering to develop. Modern dolomite can only have been forming in the last few thousand years since sea level came up and flooded the platform. So we haven't left enough time for the dolomite to fully develop. That's what I'd say to that first question. Anyway, let's come to microbial dolomite. Now, there are two, I think, very important reviews of microbial dolomite, uh, both from 2017. Uh, we have one here from um, Daniel Petrash, and I see a number of co-authors that are here in the room. Very good paper. And then we have another paper here on the right from Steve Kazmerich um, on the same topic. Basically, both of these describing the processes which we've heard about this morning, we hear about again in the next day or two, of dolomite forming from the effects of microbes and EPS. And here's a the pictures, which we've seen really this morning already, dolomite roms with EPS. With uh, yeah. um, So uh, two very useful papers. Um, and uh, the question really that comes out of these papers is that we see our dolomite, dolom dolomitic, on the way to becoming dolomite, spheroids, typical dumbbells, etc., uh, typical of a microbial dolomite. Uh, we sometimes see mimetic, perfectly preserved textures in ancient dolomites. But of course, often what we have is a whole mass of dolomite roms. So how do you get from the uh, microbial dolomite to the dolomite roms in dolomitization process? That's one of the things that uh, comes out of one of those papers. Um, therefore, perhaps microbial dolomites were not the answer. Anyway. Um, now, we've got many examples of uh, microbial dolomite from the last few years, but of course they go right back to the 90s, thanks to Judy and Chris and other people who were looking at um, modern uh, microbial mats. But in the last two or three years, we have a nice paper from Zach de Loretta, where I'm very pleased to meet you, Zach, um, and, and also some of his chums who are here in the audience. Um, uh, on the uh, sapcas down at Coral Died. I show this because we're off there, of course, tomorrow. Well, Coral Died is an amazing place. Um, and we were down there in 2014 sampling for and playing football. Um, just amazing what you find on a sapca. A football just lying around, anyway. Um, and it, so, uh, but this, this paper, this, this um, Zach Di et al.'s paper, it's a very interesting paper because what it shows is that the type of precipitate you get depends on what type of microbes you've got present. Taking two sites, they were able to show, top two pictures on the left, A and B, that um, you got what we might have said was the typical microbial dolomites, spheroids and dumbbells and so on. 
But where the microbial community was different, then here on the right, different community, DNA um, uh, community uh, analysis is the way to go. You can see these different compositions of the max from the top layer downwards, etc. In the other site, the dolomite is much more like the dolomite we know. Uh, ROMs developing. In other words, the bacterial community itself is perhaps more important than we thought. And then there was this paper which we published in 2018 um, from our work at Messaid, uh, from the, the SAP there, and, and you can see the dolomite ROMs. But of course, what I would point out, being me, is that uh, this is where we first spotted the viruses here in this uh, microbial mat, because nobody seemed to have bothered about the microbes. Um, about the viruses before. Um, all right, so now just to mention a couple of experiments with bacteria. Now this one, I highlight this one on the left, uh, which, which actually um, Zulfa has we've been telling us this morning. Um, so I highlight this one because it's following along the same idea that not any bacteria will do, not any EPS that the precipitates do depend on the composition of the EPS and the sort of bacteria. And uh, certain types of EPS or certain components in the EPS are more likely to induce dolomite precipitation than others. So here on the left, you can see that um, what we heard from uh, Zulfa this morning, that um, uh, where certain uh, um, uh, proteins, amino acids are present, then you tend to get a different type of dolomite forming. Um, so there is that control. And then here's another paper, which uh, uh, I had the pleasure of correcting the English, uh, and a bit of one called, another bit of a bit of contribution as well. Uh, this one is about to come out in, um, in Frontiers. So this is an experiment, um, experiments where we took uh, aragonite and gradually increased the magnesium-calcium ratio to see what um, uh, would happen to the aragonite. And we found that certain uh, amino acids uh, enhanced the incorporation of magnesium, and whereas other ones didn't. In other words, all this is saying is that the composition of the bacterial community is important, and the composition of the EPS is important, as well as those other things, magnesium, calcium ratio, pH, etc. All right. I will just mention this one very briefly. People have also done experiments with clay minerals, showing that certain clay minerals, the negative ones, can be involved in precipitation of dolomite. And the interesting thing is that where clays are involved, the precipitate is quite similar to a microbial dolomite, um, spheres and so on. OK, so we've got microbial dolomite. For me, microbial dolomite can answer a lot of the question of dolomite. Dolomite's not a problem for me. In microbialites, we see them throughout the geological record. In the Precambrian, many of them are dolomite. Um, and of course, there are other parts too. We've, in the Triassic, there are loads of microbial carbonates. So um, I think this is a good place where we can bring in the influence of microbes. Uh, also, when you've got mycritic dolomites, that's fine. Have the microbes there involved. So that brings us down to the one of the real outstanding questions. We talk about um, microbial dolomite. We talk about dolomitization. Are they really linked? Uh, we've got all our models for dolomitization now. Um, seawater, uh, evaporated seawater. Now we have the mixing zone again. But are the microbes involved there as well? Um, well, I would say definitely. And so uh, now we go to the dolomitization um, of uh, carbonate particles and the experimental one. We do know that with temperature, particles, uh, carbonates can be dolomitized more easily. Nice example, this one is, involves Adrian. By coincidence, I honestly didn't know you guys would be here. I'm not um, just trying to be nice to you all. But anyway, um, here we can see the dolomitization of aragonite calcite at high temperature, and the important thing here is the reaction zone, the movement of fluids uh, there. One other paper I should highlight is this one from 
Amar Al-Brahim and Maria Dietrich, who was also here, luckily. And this one is an experiment at low temperature to dolomitize bits of shell, um, bits of crab, calcite, and calcite crystals um, at low temperatures and trying to precipitate, trying to convert the, these grains to a dolomite. Unfortunately, it didn't work, if I, may, if I might say. It didn't work. Uh, but they did find that with the bacteria, there was an increase in pH and alk in alkalinity. In other words, the bacteria were doing their work, but it didn't change the mineralogy. So I'm always done. So now I want to just to alert you to a, another paper where, and I was involved in this one, where we are trying to dolomitize calcite using microbes. Okay, so we produce our own calcite seeds. And where you have microbes present when you're running the experiments, throwing in all the magnesium and so on, and we're using quite low temperatures, 35 degrees C, but a lot of salinity, 200. What you see is where you've got microbes present, you see back, uh, dolomite forming tiny hemispheres on the calcite crystals. And here on the right, you see one with no bacteria, and we get no precipitates. So using the bacteria, we see dolomite precipitate on the calcite seeds. So the interesting thing is that uh, there's no calcite in the fluid. So the calcite, calcium, for this, these small dolomite grains, crystals, are coming from the calcite. The calcite is dissolving to produce the calcium to mix with the magnesium in the fluid to give you these tiny dolomite um, particles on the surface with increasing magnesium in the fluid. Um, and you can see we've got our, on the right, the calcium magnesium peaks, probably a very high magnesium calcite, really. But anyway, so then, so what, you might say? Well, when, when you look at uh, rocks being dolomitized in the geological record, here you see some ooids. Look at the ROMs. The ROMs are located on the margins of the ooids. It's very similar to what I was just showing. These ROMs must have started forming where you had some, some reason, some seed, some new some microbe living on the ooid, and that's where they begin to form. And as a result of that, eventually, the whole oolite is dolomitized. Okay, and of course, the reason for that is that we have, once we've got the nucleus, once we've got the dolomite starting, then the rest is straightforward. Syntaxial overgrowth, and we end up with a complete um, dolomitized limestone. And the isotopes in this case, again, seawater dolomitization. Um, and I think that's the point. Once you've got the seeds there, once the dolomite has started to grow, then from then on, it's straightforward when the conditions are right for those seeds to develop into the dolomite, which eventually can replace the whole, whole limestone. And you see that, especially in the Precambrian. Well, I haven't got time because I've come to the end. And finally, I can't leave without reminding everybody about viruses. I think people have completely neglected viruses. I mean, somebody else is catching up with us. Uh, there was a paper published in 2021. But um, now we have a lot of evidence that might, viruses are being um, uh, mineralized in microbial mass. They'll be mineralized wherever the conditions are right. So here you can see viruses on the left in a Mesaid, Sabcha, uh, Matt. Uh, you can see in the middle, you see the crystals forming, and uh, viruses are the answer. Viruses are the new frontier. But look at this picture. This picture is from a few months ago. Look at the shakes of those tiny, tiny crystals, dolomite, on that calcite. Those, those shapes. Icosahedral. Icosahedral, hexagonal, they are the shapes of viruses that have been calcified. Look, here you can see calcified viruses. Look at the shape. Look at the shape of some of these. Okay, so maybe viruses are the answer. The thing is, when you do experiments with bacteria, do you remove the viruses? No, there we are. I think that is a major problem. So that's what I discovered with my Chinese colleagues. They didn't remove the viruses. Oh, well, the microbiologists can remove them. 
We've done experiments with viruses where we remove the viruses, leave the bacteria behind. So you don't really know till you remove the viruses whether you're really dealing with bacteria. Anyway, so um, there's my um, final conclusion. So I think we can explain most things with dolomites. And uh, you need a bit of time. But I do think we need the bike microbes. And we definitely have them in many of those environments where we're saying dolomitization takes place, mixing zone seawater, reflux, etc. The, the, they're there. But for me, it's a mixture of all the previous models. And this, this was um, a comfort stop in the Sabra back in 2014. OK. Thank you very much. OK, so just uh, before we take questions, just to manage everyone's expectations, we did start a little late. So uh, we're, we're going to just continue on, and, and we will end a little bit after, OK, in terms of the, the allotted time. We have time. We're going to take, we're going to make time for a couple of questions. Judith, please. Lawrence, it just occurred to me. Oh. Uh, Technology has changed so much in the last 50 years, let's say, even in the last 10 years, with genomics yeah. and way of visual. Maybe all of those old models that we had defined, yeah. we just need to throw them all away and start over again, knowing that microbes and viruses yes. are very, very, bacteria and viruses are yeah. very important. Yes. And don't try to explain. <laughs> <laughs> yes, start over again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay, you've got a good point there. Let's just accept that they're there rather than trying to argue that they're not important. Mm. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not a Dolomite expert, but I'm just trying to think loud. Um, now, I was just wondering, you showed that the different microbial communities form Dolomite, like different ways of forming Dolomite. And uh, my question is, is it the organism who is actively doing the process and what is he or what is the organism gaining out of it? Or is the organism normal physiological activity creates the right conditions for dolomite precipitation and formation, if you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, sure. No, I think it's the second part of your question. I think the actual uh, reason for the precipitation in the majority of cases is the EPS and the viruses rather than the bacteria for the precipitation. OK, you need the bacteria because they produce the EPS. And it's true, the more EPS, you have more PES as the, EPS as the salinity increases. And the EPS can be a huge proportion of the microbial mass, 50%. Even I've seen 90% written. So it's the EPS that's the crucial thing. But then, of course, it's the com composition of the EPS will depend on the bacteria and on the environment so it's yeah this is not really exactly what i meant what i meant ah. was like in in the microbial mass you find yeah. phototrophs which are able to do photosynthesis yes 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 you find aerobic yeah. and anaerobic bacteria you find yes. different types of physiological yes. groups so so whenever these processes happen they might end up reducing the ph or the increasing yeah, the yeah. ph yeah they might change the phys create a physical chemical yeah. gradient within these yeah mass. yeah yeah mm. uh, of course, you add to that the tidal uh, changes of mm -hmm. temperature on a yeah. daily, yeah, on yeah, a daily yeah, yeah. basis. So maybe at a certain you know, duration of the day, when the temperature is right, yes. when the pH is right, when what, all these conditions are right, this process happens. Yes. Otherwise, it doesn't happen continuously by the organism. So yeah. what I'm trying to say is maybe these sociological activities are creating the right conditions for dolomite formation. Yeah. Can, is that a plausible explanation? Yeah, no, I agree, with, I agree with you 100%. And I'm not quite sure I can add anything to what you're saying. I agree. It, but that's why you need particular bacterial communities to do the job to produce the dolomite. Um, and you, you need everything to be coming together. But in the majority of cases, it happens. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, you've got a good point. I think... Um, <laughs> oh, okay, well, one last one right here. We'll take, I think this was a good conversation, um, but let's have one more and then we'll end. 
Norris. Oh. Okay, you know, we published in 2016 about the virus, no? With my, my postdoc sure. here. And it was very difficult to prove that the shape is a virus. Sure. How do you, you, you okay. say that the shape? Yeah, another question. Mm -hmm. You talk about virus doesn't go alone. No, if you do experiments, no, no. you need a bacteria. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so of course. But virus the final or do you, I think bacteria still play a, a, a role to virus? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no I just said, I just said, you've got to have the bacteria, the bacteria produce the EPS. Where you have the bacteria, you will have viruses. No question. Every bacteria has its own virus. And the viruses were present there 10 times more abundant than the bacteria. That's no problem. Okay. How do you recognize viruses? That's a difficult because viruses do not produce any biomarkers that you can use to identify them. Viruses are tricky in that respect. But if you have huge numbers, as they are in huge numbers, if you have huge numbers of nanospheres, which are round about the same size, and if you see that these nanospheres tend to coalesce, which we know that they do um, from experiments we've conducted with viruses, you often find they coalesce. And if they happen to have the shape of viruses, which is this icosahedral shape with, with um, uh, looking like they've got sides, then could well be viruses. I mean, we've published quite a few papers, the, the, the re most recent one last year on viruses in Tufa. And you can see they're viruses, as distinct from vesicles, because you get bacterial vesicles too. Same size, but more spheroidal in shape. They could be calcified. They could be mineralized. Yeah, you know, it's an issue. But you can't ignore the fact that viruses are going to be... No, I don't ignore it. Tomorrow, show some biomark for virus. Oh, cool. Did you watch Red? Oh, well, that'll be very okay. interesting to see. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Okay. Okay, so for our next talk, uh, you have to forgive me if I get this wrong, but it's Adrian, is it Emma Hauser or Emma Hauser. Hauser? Okay, excellent. This is going to be the dolomite problem, a personal view. Assalamu alaikum. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks to the organizers. Similar to Maurice, I did not know what we would see, so you will see there is overlap in agreement. I will not talk about virus, though. I just spent three years of my life wearing a face mask, avoiding viruses, <laughs> so I'm not motivated to deal with viruses. So, um, we had introductions to the Dolomite problems, plenty of them, so we don't need to lose time. You see the essence is um, you see little dolomite in a modern marine environment. There's plenty of dolomite unspecified. How would that work? That um, just shows the same thing in pictures. That is from Lake Van, so that's an alkaline lake for a difference. Um, Jeremy McCormack was PhD student in our department, and we found these beautiful dolomites, stoichiometric dolomites. And we discussed whether they are actually forming in the water column or on the seafloor. And Jeremy concluded they're forming on the seafloor, probably related to bacterial activity. And Sabha of Abu Dhabi, that is Anna Geske's work, she um, developed technique to dissolve everything but stoichiometric dolomites in the sediments because there are so many magnesium-bearing minerals, it's very, very difficult to analyze the dolomite without having everything else included. So we don't need to talk about that. Also, Maurice has introduced us. There is a, all these fancy dolomite, dolomitization models next to the microbes, but as we just did, microbes may be involved also in the models here. And, um, this important paper also mentioned by Petra showing the phalloburial and influence of microbial dolomitization. On the other hand, we have Jurassic of the Alps, we have the Zechstein, we have the Jurassic in the Middle East, we have Precambrian successions, hundreds and hundreds of meters of what we call early marine diagenetic dolomite. Beautiful example, the Dolomia principale. In the Dolomites, one of my favorite field areas, just brilliant. And people just say, look, that is a good example of 
marine dolomite. Okay. And be careful if you look into the details. There is up to 10 different, certainly non-marine dolomitization phases in these rocks to start with. And there is also high magnesium calcites and late calcite cement. That makes sense because these non-stoichiometric dolomites try to get rid of the excess calcium and that just makes the late diagenetic calcite phases. Okay, that's a little warning that maybe the volumetrical dominant phase is a marine dolomite, but there is plenty of non-marine dolomites included. So, um, let's establish a working hypothesis that may seem trivial to start with. Are you actually on a video way? Can you yeah. see? Okay. Um, so I would say there is no such thing as dolomite. Very few of the magnesium carbonates are really dolomite. Maurice has emphasized that, but it is the a complex and diverse group of magnesium carbonates and related precursor minerals. They have different chemistry, different formation environments, and so on and so forth. And this nice example here is a saddle dolomite. Everybody would see why they're called saddle dolomites. It's a burial type of dolomite with warped crystal boundaries. Um, I guess that one is not microbial in origin. So, um, in my opinion, the dolomite problem, as it is phrased in countless papers, is also, not exclusively, but also a problem of concepts and terminology. And I use an example to explain why I believe so. Let us assume somebody makes the statement, roses are red. Okay? I would say, correct. At least some roses are red. So oh, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying dolomites are roses. And if you try to marry a girl and if you bring her dolomite rather than roses, that may be not successful unless she's a carbonate sedimentologist. <laughs> but I would like to use the roses example to show you that you can make a statement that is correct as such, but is not covering the full ground of the problem. Okay. So terminology, Maurice already started that. I mean, there is more than that, okay? So Dolomite is a noble sire with a lot of less noble sons and daughters that may become Dolomite one day, but not necessarily. A very high magnesium calcite may just decide to become calcite during diagenesis, may get rid of the magnesium and dolomite may de-dolomitize, and so on, so on. And we didn't talk a lot about the amorphous precursor phases, which are probably also very important in the microbial dolomitization, but they also exist in, in non-biogenic systems. Okay? So that's one problem. People say dolomite, and they mean this big family of magnesium carbonates. And if you include all of these guys, then this family is not so rare in the modern carbonate depositional environments. It's the stoichiometric dolomites which are rare. So, um, ancient dolomite precipitation environments, and here's the key. If we use the modern, whatever it is, Sabras, Sabra, where is the lady? I hope I pronounce it properly. <laughs> the modern Sabras, or um, even, even, um, Alkaline lakes, there is dolomites in caves, there is there's many places actually where dolomite forms or magnesium carbonates. Um, if you take this recent example and you want to compare it to ancient one, you need to know what you're comparing it with. Okay. And I'm just drawing a case, a number of case examples of ancient dolomites at you, just to show you the diversity. So the laser point is not working, I have to go by indicating and starting in the upper left. So that's, that's work I'm doing with my Chinese PhDs and postdocs. That's at Yakern, marine fibrous dolomite. So that it's these famous dolomites in the Ed Yakern and earlier rocks where people say this is a real first marine dolomite. It turns out actually it's a marine pore water dolomite. Okay, it forms one, two, three meters below the seafloor and not from seawater, but from modified rainfall. Then on the 
upper right. Um, discussing this with Moritz this morning, these are so-called coal balls. These are swamp environments teeming with plant life and microbial life and probably viruses. And um, occasionally you have a marine transgression and then you bring in the magnesium and you dolomitize and, and you see this, um, this on the um, this cell-like structure. These are plant cells and they're perfectly preserved. This is why the paleobotanists were so interested in these rocks. And as you see what NLD, non-luminescent dolomite and early ADD, early diatomitic dolomite, but then is also this this fracture, this vein that runs cross, across it, late diagenetic dolomite and the late calcite phase. So again, these rocks are more complicated than what some people think. Now you've seen the Dolomia principale. That's a, it's not from the Dolomia principale, but the related facies. That's what I like to call a dolomicrite. Yeah? That's um, a dolomite which is fine-grained, which is fabric retentive. You see this algae remnants nicely preserved and and there was a lot of discussion also if you read some of the um, review papers that that Maurice mentioned people say well are these dolomites here are these primary precipitates from the seawater or their replacement precipitates was there aragonite and calcite first and only second they may have replaced by high magnesium calcite or non stoichiometric dolomite or whatever you like big debate and one of these review paper states there has not been a single example of um, study documenting that this is replacing aragonite. Well if you go to the lower right and that is from the from the um, Dolomites Dolomia Principale and something that has fascinated us if you start looking very carefully as a field sedimentologist there is a lot of preserved non-dolomitized carbonate in these platforms, okay? So this is a window in the pre-dolomitization history. Um, on the right, or on the left, sorry, you see the dolomicrite, same as you have here. On the right, the recrystallized calcitic facies, okay? So I could answer this question, was this directly precipitated as a magnesium carbonate or did it replace? I would say it did replace. Uh, something that concerns me a lot is that we see dolomitization from. This is not how I would like to work these systems. I would like the, the replacement dolomite to be irregularly distributed throughout the sediment and um, with time replacing all of it. So that's something we need to look. Um, but there is also a lot of different early diagenetic dolomites up the left. You see the dolomite, it's, it's a real dolomite. This is occluding the, the burrows. They're non-compressed during burial, so it means it's an early phase because it, it preserved them from being um, compacted. Upper right, that's an overpressured basin. You see there's this fluid um, rising, breaking the, the, the rocks apart and just creating a, a carbonate that was probably more more permeable as opposed to the less permeable gray limestones. Probably also degassing took place that induced dolomitization. Here's a classical burial dolomitization from, from Spain, or here a mass flow deposit lower right with selective dolomitization. So depending on the author, they still would call this comparably early dolomitization. Maybe not seawater, but comparably early. Um, if we go in the deep burials, so temperatures 100 degree, more than 100 degree, up to 300 degrees, we have the, the saddle dolomites. These are again these dolomites with the water crystal boundaries. Talk about these. You have a, a fabric destructive dolomite phase, complex sonation. Um, and also, this is from the lower right. This is from um, Wales. Place called Chlandudno, but I don't think anybody outside of Wales can pronounce this properly. Um, it's a zebra dolomite, and that's one of the unsolved questions because if it's a burial thing and it just opens all these gashes and, and forms the, the dolomite in there, how do you how do you do that? Do you dissolve it first, or how do you do that? 
otherwise you must lift the entire stratigraphy from the space. Okay, um, short recapitulation. I need to take a step back, otherwise I cannot read. Um, so I said that's my opinion in part confusion regarding term terminology. So Maurice emphasized that it's a dolomite, it's a very high magnesium calcite, it's not the same story, okay? Um, I guess many of the dolomites, also Maurice said that, form via precursor phases, which may be calcium, which we don't recognize as dolomites today, which are the future dolomites. And in part, these are amorphous. And um, you have to be careful when you say, say modern dolomites, ancient dolomites, because you're comparing the seafloor essentially with depths of kilometers, okay? So how do we reliably establish the precipitation alteration environments of ancient magnesium carbonates in order to select those that we can really compare to the modern um, dolomitization environments? Now this is one of these diagrams that are usually um, shown in textbooks and similar in reviews papers about the different dietary environment. You see there is the mixing zone, um, with the revised mixing zone model, there is lacustrine um, dolomitization environments. These are these um, carbonate islands where you have dolomitization and, of course, the subclass. Hmm? And then the thing are usually buried. They go down at some stage. Um, marine seawater is replaced by burial brines, but at what depth, what conditions, which temperature, and so on. And finally, they go in the low-grade metamorphic, the anti-metamorphic zone, and at the end, they melt about at 500 degrees Celsius. So I try to compile literature on, on, on people trying to quantify what really is shallow and what is marine and what is intermediate and what is deep. So you see on the left, there's some pseudologrammatic scales, seafloor centimeters, meters, tens of meters, hundreds of meters, kilometers, 15 kilometers of temperature scale. Of course, I realize that every basin has a different temperature gradient, so don't, don't take this um, literally. And then the green is the mineralogy. And you see on the left in the red box, there is um, so-called marine diagenetic dolomite. And it goes down to temperatures of almost 100 degrees. So we have to be careful what we call marine dolomites because if they go down to nearly 100 degrees and burial depths of hundreds of meters, it's not really what we perceive as the early marine phase. And they are in overlap with what I call the burial dolomites, which end somewhere at 15 kilometers or so where they usually be dolomitized. I think a um, difficult topic, Peter Swart will talk about clumps, I presume, but um, we can learn something here. That is from the Diakra and again from, from China. And um, on the right, you have, you have the clumped isotope temperatures. And you see there in the order of 90 degrees or something like that. And that's one of these Precambrian platforms where everybody says, well, that is a typical example of a early diagenetic marine dolomitization, okay? So uh, where do the 80 degree or so come into the game? Um, it may be more complicated, but my very simplistic point of view is the system was, was open. These dolomites were not stoichiometric, not diagenetically stable for a certain burial range, maybe hundreds of meters. And only then they became sufficiently stable, close, and that is where the clumped isotopes locked in. So something that Maurice also hinted at. That's the marine dolomites is something that begins maybe at the sea floor and goes on and on and on and on for hundreds of meters of burial depth. And still, petrographically, if we take thin sections, people would say, okay, these are fabric retentive early marine diagenetic dolomites. They may have started as such. But in the end, they're um, marine burial dolomites. And um, Clumped has a recent paper um, where we worked with Peter and some other guys doing the fluid inclusion thermometry. 
it's cool to have the clumped isotope um, thermometer and the fluid inclusion thermometer because one gives you something like a bulk temperature, the clumped, and the other one does this super high resolution temperature analysis. And you see the, the one on the right, you see there's a zoned dolomite, the hypothetical one, ABC, three zones. And, and down here you see the, the volumetric significance of each zone and the temperature. And we find that there is one thin dolomite zone, which we refer to as B, as seen 250 to 300 degrees Celsius. So that's a, the hot fluid gushing to the system. But um, the average temperature is still in the order of about 60 degrees Celsius, okay? Something we have to take into consideration. Um, the other attempt to discriminate between different dolomite types and their proxy data, something we do um, at Bochum. We have all major elements of, of dolomite and related magnesium carbonates. We have calcium, magnesium, oxygen, carbon, strontium, stable strontium, etc. isotopes. And it's just a study by the um, head of my lab, Silvia Riedelmann. And um, you see, when you have so many isotope systems, you get a lot of noise. So it's not easy, not easy to look at these data and say, okay, obviously it's this or it's that. So what we do is principal component analysis combined with Capsulion ordering degree COD. And, and then these huge data sets start to make sense and you can start to discriminate between what you may call the positional um, signals and such that were later introduced, including, for instance, meteoric diagenesis and things like that. And that's the, the, the last sort of examples I want to show how we try to understand these systems. Now we are focusing on the saddle dolomites, the dolomites with the warped surface. So there is a pile of papers in the literature discussing why these surfaces are warped. It's not only dolomites, it's a handful of minerals with this bent crystal surfaces. Um, people seem to disagree on the reason, so we precipitated them, okay? So we tried to precipitate saddle dolomites. And we precipitated something that is, has a saddle shape, but is not a dolomite. You need to do PM and things like that to be really sure. And the model was that um, the more calcium the carbonate would contain, the high magnesium, very high magnesium carbonate, the more you would sort of put stress on the crystal structure and this stress because the calcium having a different um, size um, compared to the magnesium that would induce the bending. Okay, that was the hypothesis. Turns out these guys here, the nicely bent, less calcium than those who are not bent, okay? So I really take that personal because I'm a carbonate person. I like carbonates. I assume carbonates should like me too. They should be loyal to me. They should do what I expect them to do. They don't, okay? I consider dissolving these guys in acid to punish them. Okay? No, that's work in progress, okay? It's not so easy, obviously. So um, taking out one of these classical papers, one of um, Warren, this is how I would answer the question he raises there. Why is there so little modern dolomite? Okay, we only see a small fraction of the total of dolomite forming now. Okay, we don't see all the big kilometers of burial dolomite forming now. Okay, we don't call the precursor phases dolomite, but maybe a dolomite in the near future or not the near future. Why is there so much ancient dolomite? because we compare an observational window that deep or maybe that deep, or I, Judy convinced me that her trenches were significantly deeper, so let's call them two meters, um, with one that goes over kilometers. We compare centuries with billions of years, okay? And um, how did the chemistry of ancient dolomite forming settings evolve over time? I would ask which dolomitization setting, okay? Because there's so many. Yeah? So 
does that mean there is no dolomite problem? Well, it depends. Perhaps the problem lies not there, at least from my point of view, where people have been looking. Um, I guess Peter will say a lot about the Bahamas. Look, that's one of the fancy places today to go when you want to study recent carbonate. Very beautiful. And it's 80, 800 kilometers in dimension. So that's substantial, I would say. And there is dolomite. Okay? I'll put this in context with Cretaceous platform. Um, in the red box is the dolomite based on scale. Hmm? Okay. So we're just not talking the same thing when we take modern um, dolomites and dolomites of the Mesozoic or the Paleozoic. This dimension is very different. So, um, go back a little bit again. I think we can understand part of the dolomite problem, not everything, part by having a concise terminology, by considering the diversity of different magnesium carbonates, big family, dolomite being one member of the family. And we need to acknowledge the temporal and spatial dimensions of dolomitization environments today versus geological past. So my personal dolomite problem is my limited imagination when I'm trying to capture the timescales and spatial dimensions involved in ancient dolomite system. And I think the last word should have this guy here, who was obviously much, much superior to me when it comes to understanding time and space. Thank you, that was fantastic. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Judy? I really like what you said about terminology. And I have tried to look for the official mineralogical definition of dolomite. Is there one? It, you know, can, is there, a, you know, there are so many, the whole range, but what is dolomite? The problem, is you ask a crystallographer, he, ha, he or she has a definition, you ask a chemist, they have a different definition. I agree. Agree. So many years after the Dolomieu. Thank you. It's a um, beautiful talk, amazing roses. And um, I, I have a, I have a question about your subtle dolomites. I really love them. Yeah, they look beautiful. And you see that you were thinking that uh, calcium concentration, as far as I understood you correctly, and it was not. What are the other hypotheses? Or do you have any working hypothesis? Yeah. And so another reason may be iron, actually. Many of the saddle dolomites are iron rich, and not calcium. Okay? Yeah. Um, and another hypothesis, it's not one mineral, but it's a composite, it's a compound mineral <laughs> built of many subcrystals, each of which is slightly reoriented to make this saddle shape. And we see both in our experiments, okay? Yeah, I, I, I saw that also in our experiments. It, it's actually a question that you need crystallographers to answer. And see you on it, okay? Thank you so much. Okay, so with that, our, and remember, We've got a couple of days, so if there's any other questions or if there's something that you think about, feel free to just find one of the previous speakers uh, when you're getting coffee. Maybe you can corner them before you get coffee and get them to answer your question. And so with the next one, it's going to be Dr. Moody, Dr. Maria Moody, and stratabound dolomite and stratigraphic patterns. It's going to take one second for us to switch over the computer. She's not here? Are you? Are you? Okay. okay. So his colleague is going to give the talk. Yeah. And it's on a different computer, so one moment. It's okay. It's my dog a model. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, but how 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 you you change it? Okay, thank you. Uh, as you know, I, Maria Muti could not come. She's sick. And they asked me, Sally asked me to make a presentation. You know? Then I, because people the whole day talk about microbial, then I'm going to talk about how it's a, history, it's a historical talk that about the microbial model and so. I, want to, I like to start with this, this slide, you know. It's not a new idea, you know. This guy, more than 100 years ago, said that. Look, understand the essential role played by bacterial phenomena may be the solution for the dolomite problem. He also added that, that also for the magnesium cycle in the ocean, you know, is a, okay, what we're doing now, we'll go, we start seeing that people talk in the past, you know, and, and so I started to look the work in Brazil, the, the area they call the Sun Coast, because as here we have microbial mat, you know, you, see, you can see here, the hypersaline shallow environmental, the bottom of the water is anoxic, you know, we have a lot of microbial mat. Have dolomite formation, stromatolite grows there. No, it's a very special environment. Then I, in the 80s, I started to study the German in Brazil. And then we found this microbial dolomite, you know, it is the call proto dolomite at that time. And left, uh, I then said there's too many names, no? Proto dolomite, and I, so you can see bacteria is not the but you know, we, just the environment, they have two seasons, no, dry season, rain season, you know, is uh, it's different. It's, there's upwelling zone here in this area that means the, the climate is, is completely different from Rio de Janeiro city, you no? Know? It's a semi arid conditions. Have the dry and wet season. You can see the lagoons, the, the, the dry season, you don't see more water, you see only the microbial mat, and the wet season, the water take over. So, we, so I did my master's thesis, let's say in the 83, 84, I, the only place in Brazil have electronic microscope, SCM, was in Petrobras. You know? Then I have this picture, you know? the eight you know? and so. What's that, you know, was really a, you know? My, my master thesis has only a same picture. In that time, you know, if you have a microscope picture, you make a thesis, you know? Now everybody has a microscope in the, in the kitchen, you know, everywhere. But now in the age, you no. Know, then we found this, though, but it's not Aragonite, so it's kind of a Dolomite. You see the EPS there, you call algae, you know? But the conclusion is, you know, this carbon is autogenic, you have sulfate reduction, because no step in the, in the mud, you know, you know that the smell can, H2S, you know, and they saw there's some activity of sulfate reduction. There is some little pore water, and the conclusion was the mineralization induced process is responsible for carbonate formation, okay? This was my master's thesis. I forget the master, I apply for a PhD, you know, and then I, I wrote for Jude McKinney. Jude McKinney said to me, okay, I, I was ready to go to Florida. She said, no, I moved to Zurich. Then I went to Zurich, you know, to do it. Oh. And so, and then we make some messaging pictures in Zurich. Jude was in GSA, and she showed this dolomite there. And they, sorry about the picture, you know, because I prepared this talk here. And, uh, this, you see the question of this, some, uh, today, Morris said is, is, is virus, but you know, in that time, Professor Folk said, the master Judy said, listen, Judy, 
these nanobodies in the dolomite crystal phase is a nanobacteria, okay? No, so just wait. <laughs> well, how to prove this observation, no? And so, we discussed about that, you know, my then, I was, okay, the only way that we have that time was to do this microbe experiment. You know? And so, I should show the, I met this guy by chance and nobody wanted to work. You know, if I want to present the dolomite, the microbiology said, for what? You know, they don't, they don't care about that. And then you find Albert Chant, he was in Zurich. Then he said, okay, let's go to do the experiment. You mimic the seawater composition of the lagoons. You took the mixed culture. After one year, you know, you have this crystal. You can see here, you have the quartz grain. And then you have this. People say that which now people say it's, my, it's, it's bacteria, but it's not, it's not it's a bacterial virus. That time it was none about of bacteria. Okay? So it's not virus. Here you can see the divide here, no? My, uh, virus doesn't do that. And so, and uh, you have to be careful. So, and then that time we started to do the microbiological approach. Now that we go to the field, measure the environmental, and go to the lab, and mimic the environment, and apply geological record. No? I do. So you have in the, the lagoon that this was in the lab, no, the same shape, the same size. So this I like very much. This is a paper from Tomás and Monica. You know? Like very much this paper because you know you see here, you see this the nanoglobin there. No, no, it's a it's virus. No, it's not virus. See the bacteria here. The nanoglobin grows on the cell wall, and with time they make this chain of nanoglobins, no, and then come together. And uh, it's a process to make this 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 magnesium carbonate. So I like very much this picture from Tommaso, you know? They want to have you to show this, we have this. But if you look in detail, you know, this, how the crystal rhombo grow, is full of uh, nanoglobin, you know? Look like this nanoglobin, the experiment, they come together, they become these rhombs. With time, they become smooth. You don't see any more than nanoglobin. But the, 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 the seed is like that, you know? It's a microbial process, you know? They do this inside the EPS. So in the EPS, they have bacteria, so there is everything there. So if, if you make the dolomite model, okay? This is a dolomite model, no? You publish, you know? In nature, and also, so, which journal is this? It's the sedimentology, no? Sedimentology, so, yeah. And so in the microbial model, we'll say, you see, so for the, the engine, you know, they take the sulfates and uh, they make bicarbonate, this, uh, they take this magnesium that's available as, and they make the, the dolomite. They, with the time, the aging, they become more stoichiometric. And so you have a lot of paper, you know, have this experiment, this uh, help to make some calibration, you know, John I asked me to, to work with Magali to give some samples to calibrate the clumping. We have the partition facts uh, for Monica. We have the, the fractionation factor with Stefano and Judy here both for, for, for te value temperature. No, this experiment helps to, to give some tools to solve the dolomite problem. And so, because, you know, this will have a lot of publicity when this, this will work, you know? You know, in the science in you, they say, make a big mount with a tiny bacteria, you know? And people write to us, oh, it's not right, you know? You have in the Correo de la Sierra, you know? This in the Italian, you know? Another one, when the guy said that the King Lauri lie because they didn't do the Rosengart. The Rosengart was made by bacteria, you know? In the German, you know? Also, the first, the 
bacteria that build mounds, you know, it's really, was good because you get a lot of uh, fund. You no, know, people who say that you get any project you write, you, you get the money. And no, uh, but in the science news, we think that's very special. The science news was one of the best paid in the 1995. But you know, if you look, was in the biology. The geology doesn't care about that. You know, it's already the biologist said, okay, it's uh, let's go to write to biology. You know, they understand much better. And uh, so, with this money that you get, you could do perform the aerobic experiment. If you see here, when you have the colony, you have a crystal. When you don't have a colony, you, you don't have a crystal. That show that you know, the the colony catalyze this. Although, if you leave the, the media without the bacteria evaporate for time, you have precipitation as well for some magnesium carbonate. It's like that, you know, see, the mud is made for dead sea, for halophilic bacteria, you know, and so on. And so, this is the, the uh, the terminology you now is dolomite or very high magnetic oxide, doesn't matter. So, and you just so want to she talk about that to, to make the hydrological model versus the microbial model. And so, Tomas did a very nice job, you know, and uh, he said that he said that uh, EPS, they are important, but also, he's also, if you look, he also started to see there's a silica involvement in this, you know? There's silica there, you know? When they, in, to get, when they come to the dolomite, silica is, is involved in the, there in the cycle. No. Okay. okay, when you publish this paper here, you publish, okay, well, it's ferro and dolomite, it's there. If you read there, it's the ferro dolomite, because you have this peak here, one, one five, and so, I professor them, you know? Wrote to data, said no, it's not dolomite. Like you write, you know, is you have to the definition, you, know, you have to do things, no. It's not dolomite, it's a uh, anchorite. Then you have to write to na once in nature, you know, okay. No, because you know the peak is there 15, is 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 but no, in the, the, the same year, this person make experiment for a solid solution, dolomite and chlorite. And then when you put iron in the structure, the order peak disappear, no? More iron, less order peak. You have the iron there. That means the peak 0 0.5 is 0 to 1, no? It's still there, 0 0.15, you know, that our experiment is 0 to 1 disappear, no? Is a dolomite with iron in the composition. So, and the guess here is the Greg in 2016 said the mineral is very high magnetic oxide. The peak, the peak of the 15 is most probably the phosphate. Judy kept this crystal. Okay, Judy, give me the crystal. Let's go to measure this phosphate for this guy. We don't find any phosphate. No, it's really no. Okay, even no, even the. Even in the literature, you know, dolomite is diagenetic, you see? They come from peridolomite to anchorite to high magnetic oxide. You know, even the literature, you know, you know you say that. Okay, then you, you start to look at this. Dolomite's not a continuum, you know, in the, you have layers, you know? What is layer? Why? You see the crust, the crust in the top? When they develop the clamp isotope, you see the crust to have this ordering peak, the, the, the other doesn't have, you know. Then you make the clamp, you know, you see the crust has a, the water is 5.1, the other one, the, the water is 2.4. It's about 3,000 difference, you know. It's a very, to be a dolomite or a dolomite, you need evaporative water. Because you, now you use the, more the, the natural environment, you know, like you said, to do this kind of stuff. You put a logger there, you know, the temperature, you know, everything. You know? 
Then you know that, you know, this is a poem, you know, you see here this, when the, the water is really cold, but all the humidity is, is, is precipitated offshore. You know? He is very dry. You see in the 2 point, 2000, 2004, you have this phenomenon of a dolomite or the dolomite forming. So you did some biomark, you know. You see the hydrogen in the specific compound is very, very negative, show that the, the vegetation is cactus. You know? See the climate is really more arid than, than today. Also you, you did some, alk some alkanones offshore. In the same time the water was, was was colder. That is from Gabi Nascimento. And so, you have, when you have this condition of very vaporitic, you form the microbial matter, you form this, this concretion, no? which one? Okay. It's concretion that, that can keep, this pose can keep some biomarks. The, that you make a new model for that, you know. This model is to have dolomite, you need some oceanic, oceanic uh, phenomenon, no? so like the El Nino can, or La Nina can change the temperature of the water. That why you have less, less uh, rain, and then you have more precipitation of dolomite. That's why they, 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 they precipitate in layer. So, and Judy, now come to Judy's hypothesis. <laughs> Judy say, uh, you talk about triatic dolomite. You know? And so, why do people, who do they help dolomite? You can find in Spain, Italy, Switzerland, Croatia, you know? The Tethys Ocean, you know, is a is a is a huge you know, uh, formation, you know. And Judy thinks that you know, you have to prove that the hypothesis, you know, that the Tethys in that time was a had an upwelling. I don't know who wanted to prove that, you know, how to prove that, but you no. Know, Based on these observations that you have there in this upwelling zone in Brazil, you have more upwelling, you have more dolomite. Upwelling is stronger, you have more dolomite. And so, how to explain this huge phenomenon that that is in the late Triassic? And a lot of Jews said, no, it's upwelling, it's upwelling. Okay. And so, it is going on. And so, and you took two. 2014, you, you, you had this paper, no? And you have the last month that you have to publish this paper, no? Because you know, it's, because you start to see that you know, in this my living microbial mass, you see some phenomena like the the cells some metallizing and become a little small nano nanoparticle, you know? and so. And then we you try to do the speci specific TM, you no, know, is you no, know, to see what's that, you no, know, was or it's virus, you no, know, virus that was, and Muriel, Muriel was my postdoc. She she was really uh, key to to publish this paper. You now it was difficult to publish because it's difficult to to believe that this small. This small uh, sphere there, you no, know, is is really a virus that was, you no. Know, how to prove that, you know? That ask ask Morris, you know, you can see this could be nanoglobes, could be anything, but you know, virus have to have have to do a metagenomic. You did just about fifty thousand we use, you know, to publish this paper. Oh, you know, but I want to finish my how long? I want to finish now because I you know when do we start to do the the microbial dolomite, you know, you we have to define which bacteria responsible for the dolomite formation, then we isolate one 
when we spring the fall supervision by resilience or a protobacteria, you know, the tree of life, you know, the phytogenic tree, or it's simple like that. You know. See, very simple now. But if you go now, this is from the ODP, if you see the, the phylogenetic tree, you know, things not easier as before. You have to do much more. You no, know, it's not cheap. Coming here to say, oh no, this is that and that, you know. Now the the bio, the, the the biology now is much more. People say the the the, the to make the diversity now you have to have a, a big lab, you no. Know? And you see now this the, the, this this branch doesn't go in that direction. You see, they start to go to swim, you know. They change they change genes, you know. And so, how to do this be more difficult than before? I think I didn't. To publish a paper now, uh, have a paper now to publish, is really difficult. Talk about the talk about virus. And so, also the dolomite was the first mineral in the uh, carbonate mineral you find in the geological record. No? It, together, 3.8 in this biological clock here, you have 3.8. No? Have life, you have dolomite there too, but not the other mineral. So if you look life there, life go until today, you know. The microbe come, they survive the whole geological time. Uh, but you now today, we don't, it's not simple like that, it's a biological clock. I got this also for the ODP, you know. So the, the phylogenetic tree go deep, you know, they go deep. They start with the big bang, you know. So the 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 come, all the element comes, you no. Know, that time you start to see that life is is in, in, evolved since that, you know. It's not so, so simple like you see in our vision now. And I just like I'd like to to finish this talk just to because I'm in work on that now for the last four years, you no. Know, it's not easy. How where you put this guy now? Where? That's the big, it's not easy, you no? Know? Yeah. Where they go in the, because every, we have a 40, about 20% of virus in our genome, actually. So these guys have been work in the evolution, also could be involved in the mineralization. Okay, thank you. So we have time for one talk, uh, one question. And then we have one more talk. Do we have any questions? No question. Thank you so Everybody much. Understood. Everybody understood. Everybody <laughs> understood. Thank you. OK, so we have one more talk by Dr. Peter Swart. And he's going to talk about hypersaline origins of Bahamian dolomites, evidence from new geochemical proxies. So one minute, and we're going to swap over. Yeah. All right, thank you for staying to the end of the day and thank you for the organizers. I want to um, share with you a little bit of the history of the work on dolomites in the Bahamas. And um, so uh, the take home message is that originally we thought the Bahamas was quite different from the uh, Middle, Middle Eastern type Sabka dolomites. But in actual fact, there may be some similarities. And I want to go over that with you. Uh, and this conclusion has been reached uh, through a couple of different new uh, geochemical proxies, including the CAP47 value and this uh, new one we're just uh, looking at called CAP48. 
And uh, we think we can sort of uh, use uh, the delta 34S, that's the sulfur isotope value, and the cap 48 value to distinguish between bacterial mediated dolomites and open system dolomitization. So, of course, the Bahamas and Qatar had the same latitude, uh, just above the Tropic of Cancer. Uh, the only the main difference, of course, is that there's this vast ocean basin to the um, east of the Bahamas, and we don't have that in the uh, Arabian Gulf. And, of course, the rainfall is quite different, except for the last couple of days, of course. But uh, in the Bahamas, we have an average of 1,500 millimeters a year, and uh, in Qatar we have 75, which actually varies quite a lot. That can be much lower than that and can be slightly higher. So I want to start my uh, story with um, a person we've already heard about several, uh, several talks today, and that's this guy here, Gene Shin, when he was a, a younger person. And here he is leaving Doha in 1967 with his family, three boys and his wife, Pat. Now, Gene Shin uh, graduated from the University of Miami. He went there on a music scholarship, and he got a uh, bachelor's degree in biology. He worked for a year as a lab assistant at the University of Miami, and then he was hired by Bob Ginsberg in the Shell Development Company, which had an office in Miami, which is a suburb of Miami called Coral Gables. And he worked on various different exciting projects. I won't go to all of them, but it's all detailed brilliantly in his book, uh, including his history before he became went to the University of Miami. And uh, one of the projects he did was uh, he discovered dolomite in this area here called Three Creeks on Andros Island. And he published this paper in 1965. And when he was in uh, Qatar, he actually did a lot, various different uh, uh, projects. Uh, perhaps his biggest discovery was he discovered marine cementation. And that was his big, you know, uh, no one believed that actually you could cement carbonates in the marine environment until he discovered this. And it was basically a lot of opposition at Shell to actually push this idea through. They all thought it was basically the rocks had to be exposed to fresh water. So after he uh, went back to Rijswijk in the Netherlands, and then he came back to the United States, and, and after a few years, he uh, started working for the United States Geological Survey, and he set up a, a, a field station or a station on Fisher Island in Miami. Uh, it was uh, an old quarantine station, uh, which Bob Ginsburg uh, had basically um, taken over and now Bob Ginsburg at this time is now working at the University of Miami. So I arrived in, the, in Miami in 1982, and we started working together with um, uh, various people. And I met Gene Shin, and I was involved with several projects with Gene. And one of these, uh, he told me about uh, a hole he had basically excavated in the Umsad Sabka in Qatar and how water had flowed into this hole and had turned milky and started frothing, you know. And he, and he basically said it was dolomite, you know. So he actually had some of this, this sample uh, precipitate still, and he had some of the water, and he gave it to me, and I analyzed it. I had my mass spectrometer just started uh, a few years before, or a year before that, and uh, we put this abstract together, Judy was in Miami at the time, occasionally, and we discussed it. And I wrote this abstract, and we submitted it to GSA 1987, as you can see up there. And we, he had a video, and the video showed the water coming in, turning milky and everything like that, you know. And so we went to GSA, I think it was in, in Orlando or somewhere like that. Anyway, we had this television screen up there, and we showed the video. It was quite innovative back in 1987. Unfortunately, I have no idea where the video is now, but nonetheless, uh, we measured some isotopes. I'll talk about that in a second. And he, this is his book, you know, and he sent me a copy, you know, and this, I'm very proud of this because he inscribed it. And it says up there to Peter, for Peter, the only geochemist I can trust. So, 
And uh, I guess part of that actually also uh, relates to the fact that we worked on whitings quite a lot, and I won't go into that now, but basically he was a bit of a maverick because he had went contrary to a lot of people's different ideas. Anyway, I immediately do what you do if you're at a soft money institution in the United States, and I wrote a proposal to the National Science Foundation. Here it is, the cover page really hasn't changed in all these years. Here was 1988, only $58,000. It was, of course, mercilessly declined, and I you know, immediately went around working on something else. But we actually had started it. I had a postdoc at the time, Steve Burns, and he basically had started trying to uh, reenact what we think happened. You know, so the water was degassing. We thought it was very high CO2 water. It was degassing and so on. But we, we never pursued it. But just to, just to show you, oops, that's not right to show you that we actually had the dolomite. So here's some SEM pictures I took of it. So here's the dolomite there. It's about that scale bar is two microns. There's the XRD. If you read XRD, you can see that there's a dolomite peak there as well as a few other little peaks there. And when I measure the stable isotopes, this is all basically support of the, the idea that it was spontaneously precipitating. The oxygen isotopes were about plus 5.5. The water was between six and seven and using Linton Land's equation at the time, uh, it gave us a temperature which seemed fairly reasonable. So that's my connection to uh, uh, the Sab, Sab Puzz or Sab whatever it is in, in Qatar. And so when I also came to uh, Miami, I started working on the Dolomites in the Bahamas because this was supposed to, you know, they, they, uh, the subsurface of the Bahamas is fairly well pervasively dolomitized and has never, never been buried significantly. So it was supposed to be the Rosetta Stone of how to work out, why, you know, why dolomite formed. So one of Ginsburg, Bob Ginsburg's students was this guy, John Michel Delons, and we worked on the island of San Salvador, which is the farthest uh, to the right yellow dot there. And we published a paper in 88 and after uh, John Michel went to work for Shell Oil, as it happens as well, and after he had left, um, we finished this paper, and I had already moved ahead uh, with looking at um, strontium isotopes to sort of date the dolomitization. Art Saller uh, had just published a paper on NEVTAC, and he had used strontium isotopes, so I thought I'd emulate the uh, Art Saller, and I measured the strontium isotopes in this core, and it looked like the dolomitization based on strontium isotopes was significantly uh, younger than the actual age. So I concluded that the dolomitization was not contemporaneous, and therefore I eliminated the mixing zone, which was in, much in the vogue in those days, and hypersaline models. But if we actually look at the dolomite, and so here is the core uh, from the San Salvador, and um, to just to give you, put your eye in there, the age is the green uh, Pleistocene, and the Pleistocene is white, Miocene is orange, I guess the color is. And then the, the top part, the Pleistocene is blue, is not dolomitized, it's limestone. The bottom of the Miocene is also limestone. And that whole section in between there is all dolomite. I've blown up the whole thing, that little where the arrows go. And you can see there are lots of these so-called, what we said at the time, were subaerial exposure surfaces, but are they really subaerial exposure surfaces? There are seven uh, in there, that, that section blown up there, and each of those subaerial exposures were on top of these sort of little alternations of different types of dolomite, which um, we, we call crystalline mimetic dolomite and fabric destructive dolomite. So I always thought there must have been some connection between the surfaces and the dolomitization rather than the whole thing just being dolomitized by normal seawater. So, uh, and that came about by looking at these islands over the 30, 40 years that I've actually been in Miami. We've done lots and lots and lots of field trips. We've been to all the islands there. I just want to show you a couple of them. And my favorite is Eleuthera. Uh, and uh, Luthra, I've been there quite a lot recently or in the last 15 years or so because we've been looking at speleothems in caves there and we were monitoring the cave and uh, we also had a look at these ponds up there. So these, that sort of light green thing are these sort of shallow ponds 
and um, I call them stinky ponds. And um, we were there actually a couple of years ago with Audrian. Uh, we took a field trip there with his group, the Coram group there. And um, I think this is a picture when we were up there in the field. And this, there was a paper there by Dupra and Peter Fisher's group. And um, they described the zonation. They have basically carbonate crust around the outside. There's no precipitation in the center. Uh, some of the old mangroves, which are now all dead there, are completely encrusted, as you can see in the bottom right there, in high mag calcite crusts. And if we look at what the characteristics of the water is, okay, there's, by the way, there's not any dolomite there, I should imagine. I just want to put that out there. But the water is quite saline, but it's very variable. Certain times you go there, it's, it's fresh and then it's salty uh, because the seawater is derived from groundwater seepage. It's also salt from aerosols, which is blown in. Of course, there's fresh water supplied by rain, because the rain, there's quite a lot of rain, but it's highly evaporated. So the oxygen isotopes are very positive. Um, the chemistry is quite dynamic. There's very high concentrations of calcium and a little bit of magnesium in there. It's quite warm. I call it toasty, quite toasty. Uh, there's a lot of organic material, but the carbonates are not excessively negative. That's because there is a lot of carbonate material in there, which is, you know, it's carbonate buffered. And there's a thin sediment cover over the karstic Pleistocene. So if we look at the crust there, this is one from one of the ponds on Eleuthera. It has this sort of, uh, we sort of seen this sort of similar stuff in some of the pictures we've seen today. And this is what it looks like on the top there. As I said, there's not any dolomite in there. But that doesn't mean that there was dolomite in the past or in previous uh, periods. If you look at the comparison between the core, the San Salvador core, and, and the, that little uh, thing of the, the modern, you can sort of see some similarities there. And now we look at some of the other islands. This is um, Little Darby. And this is data. These are data from Al Piggott, who was a graduate student at the University of Miami. And uh, there are four cores here. And one of them actually does have dolomite in it, the anaconda. But generally speaking, that's the exception rather than the rule on some of these islands that we've looked at. And now let's look at San Salvador. So San Salvador has the same islands, actually has many more um, lakes than even uh, Eleuthera. And um, it has... So it ha would have expected to be similar to Eleuthera. And so let's look at um, a little part of this core now. Uh, when the, I already had sampled this way back in the 80s when I was working with Jean-Michel, and Jean-Michel had already left, and I was sort of looking at this whole idea that there was some relationship with, between these boundaries. So I made this, as a simple geochemist, I did a little bit of sedimentology, and I described the core and uh, that's over on the right-hand side. We did some geo took all these samples for the, for the simple geochemistry. So you can see that there's a change in the, the stoichiometry, the mole percent carbonate. There's a change in the strontium concentration, oxygen isotopes, and so on. And we put this in the paper. Um, but we basically really didn't explain it too well. And... Um, but what needed to be explained now was that we had all these alternations of the different types of dolomite, the crystalline dolomite and what we call the microsucrosic, which was basically a fabric destructive dolomite, had different permeability and porosity, which is quite a complicated story. And we didn't really know what the mechanism was. You know, I, in 87, I said that it was just normal seawater being you know, driven through the platform. Uh, originally, the core had been described by a guy called Peter Subko, and he said it was mixing zone. And then one of my, my first graduate student, actually, my first PhD student, Volker Varenkamp, had, had done a study on Little Bahama Bank, and we basically had classified all the dolomite in the same manner as San Salvador, and he basically suggested it was seawater driven by a mixing zone recharge, which is similar to what Morris was talking about with the, the mixing zone. But I want to know what the, you know, the association with subaerial exposure was and whether really those were subaerial exposure surfaces or whether they were mats from these ponds. And, you know, another question is why the Pleistocene was not dolomitized. All right, so fast forward 
to the clumped era. So for those of you who are not clumped aficionados, clumped isotopes give you the temperature of the rocks uh, without having the problem of having to know what the water value is. So if you measure the oxygen isotopes, you get a combination of temperature and salinity, essentially. Uh, clumped isotopes give you the, the temperature, assuming that everything's in equilibrium, which we'll assume for the moment it is. And then you can calculate the salinity or the delta 18 over the water. And so here's that same sequence there with the two surfaces on the top and the bottom of these, the crystalline mimetic, uh, which are generally, at, these surfaces are generally at the top of the crystalline or near the top of the crystalline mimetic. And as you can see, uh, there is a, a sort of a trend there uh, for the tops of these and the bottoms to be toasty or warmer. You know? So if you accept that, then you can calculate well, you can accept it or not, but then you can use the delta 18 O values of the dolomites, which you actually measured, in a suitable equation, one of the nine or 10 equations which actually exist for dolomite. But um, you know, we use the most recent one, which was by Harita. And um, there you actually can calculate a sort of similar sort of pattern with some variability which suggests that the tops and the bottom was, were salty, which would agree with our being the water being derived from these ponds. So also, uh, I've been working with a guy called John Higgins, and he, had, he wanted samples from, um, from the Bahamas. So I sent him all these samples, and he did some of them for their uh, magnesium and calcium isotopes. And, um, and he, he published a paper in 2018, the, the reference is over there. He didn't actually relate any of the data to sedimentology at all. He just sort of threw it out there. And so I took his data from this paper and uh, also from the San Salvador core and also from the other cores he analyzed. And I put it on the same sort of plot here. And again, there's some variability, but generally speaking, you see that the tops associated with the exposures are uh, or, or the, the, the mats are actually maybe slightly lighter in the delta 26 M, delta 26 magnesium, and they're slightly more positive in the delta 44 calcium. And that, can, that is consistent with open system, more open system at these surfaces, uh, both at the top and the, and the bottom, and the more closed system in the center. All right, so you know the paragenesis of that, and I'll have to do a an Audrey and stand back and read it. Is that you know that the sea level during the Pliocene sea level oscillations were not as large as they were during the Pleistocene, and we think that these hypersaline ponds uh, were formed every time the sea level came down, and basically the, the hypersaline ponds reflux downwards, and it's possible that. You know, during the Pliocene, the climate was actually drier than it is now. Therefore, the salinity of these ponds would have been higher and more similar to what we see in the in the Middle East. And then, uh, but as the sea level uh, um, fell further, maybe the this you know, so some dolomitization occurred. And as the sea level fell further, then this dolomitized section would have been subject to meteoric diagenesis, which would actually help remove the limestone and create some of the present porosity permeability uh, patterns that we see. And successive sea level rises would produce a new patch of sediment, which would have, would have uh, experienced the same process all the way up to the Pleistocene. And then in the Pleistocene, the sea level changes were much larger. And therefore, we didn't get the same sort of phenomena. Therefore, that's why we don't get the Pleistocene uh, um, dolomitized to the same extent, or you know, the climate could have gotten wet, wetter at that time period. Um, and then in order to explain the strontium isotopes, you would have to basically imp you know, um, suggest a further stage of dolomitization, perhaps similar to what we originally imagined. Uh, the, the, uh, the, so marine fluid would come through the section, finally dolomitizing everything. All right, so what about biological influences? Well, there are a couple of different uh, ways we can look at that. One is sulfur isotopes. We can look at clumped isotopes. Uh, magnesium isotopes have been suggestion, suggested and also carbon isotopes. But carbon isotopes haven't been too fruitful in this thing because they're really rock dominated and there's a lot of myogenic carbonate in there, which basically tends to 
you know, uh, swamp the any biological signature. But well, let's have a look at some of these other ones. Well, to to do that, I just want to quickly go over these two cores which uh, we drilled in the uh, 1991 and a result of a, a proposal uh, Bob Ginsburg and I wrote to the National Science Foundation. We drilled these two cores on the clinoforms and the endoforms of the prograding margin of Great Bahama Bank. We called them clino and endo. And uh, later uh, we did a, we also wrote a proposal, Gregor Everly and I wrote a proposal for the, um, to drill the extension of this, the western line into the Straits of Florida, and that was leg 166. And based on that one, we could date everything really well, you know, just using normal uh, biostratigraphy that you use in ODP, and then use the seismic lines to trace them up onto the platform. So that was an incredibly successful leg, although, you know, when we actually proposed it, the proposal, both the ODP leg got a tremendous amount of pushback Judy was involved with shepherding that through, you know, and I remember one meeting she was taken aside and saying, I, I really think you don't want to make a fool of yourself or something like that. I, I, I know the people involved here, but I'm not going to say who they were, but they basically told her that she should not support the proposal, but she was stuck to her guns. And now that proposal, you know, that leg has been such a successful uh, leg and everybody wants samples from it. And, and basically, mainly because it's connected up to the shallow show a platform. Anyway, that's another story. So here's the uh, age depth block for Clino. Age along the top, depth along the bottom. Uh, what I want to point out is that there were two major disconformities or unconformities in the, in the core there, which shown by the blue arrows. One was actually an erosional disconformity at 1,204 feet, which is 367 meters approximately. Um, and then the other one was 1759 feet, and that's about, you know, four million years or so. So this is a major change, you know, breaks in deposition there. And if we look at the, um, this plot here, it shows the mineralogy. And uh, Clino, the one we were just looking at, is the one on the left. Dolomite is the, the red color. And you can see that the, the red color, uh, the, the, uh, there's uh, increases just below those blue arrows, which are the disconformities. And also shown on this are the undercore, which is the furthest, further in. You see there's an interval there, which is completely dolomitized in the middle, more or less. And then there's San Salvador core, which is fairly well dolomitized throughout. And then these other colors here are the sulfur isotopes. So the sulfur isotopes should be uh, plotted where this red bar is. Uh, that's the seawater, and 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 und in San Salvador, all the actual data fall on that line, so they're just exactly where they were. They would there's no evidence of an increase in sulfur, whereas in the Clino cores, you can see there's this huge increase in sulfur isotopes, which indicates bacterial sulfate reduction. Okay, that's the only way you can actually get that increase, and it has to happen in a closed sort of system. So beneath this boundary here, at five. Um, 530 uh, something, uh, basically you see that there's an interval which is sort of similar to seawater and then it increases. The black dots are the strontium concentration. So as we're going from an open system to a closed system, the sulfur isotopes kick up, strontium kicks up because of recrystallization, it happens both of those, both of those intervals. Unda and San Salvador don't have that. So they're basically not as much influenced by the, the, the bacterial processes as Clino. And uh, the, the, the um, clumped isotopes, okay, the clumped isotopes on Clino look like this. So basically what we have here is the temperature and uh, that little sort of triangle there shows how the temperature would increase, you know, according to expected geothermal gradient. So the top of the core it's going down, it's increasing as the temperature would increase, as you expect, and uh, the dots reflect uh, recrystallization or dissolution reprecipitation. There's a lot of scatter because there's a lot of different allochems in there, corals and you know, uh, non-scalable non material. And when you go down to these two hard grounds, you see that the, at 367, the system is sort of reset. We sort of imagine the bottom temperature would be at 20, but all the sediments are much more, more warmer than that. So there's a bit of a increase, we'll call it non-equilibrium 
conditions so that the CAP 47 is not actually recording what it should do because there's, it's out of equilibrium. And then we go to the second one down, the 530 one, it also has this non-equilibrium effect in the CAP 47. It's not large, and a lot of people speculated that it was not real, but we, you know, pretty sure that it is real. By the way, the different colors are dolomites, which we separated out. So you can notice that this sample is partially dolomitized, but we leached out the samples and we got 100% dolomite. We actually did experiments, so we know that the clumped isotopes, that method doesn't affect the clumped isotopes. So that wasn't really that convincing, but when we, there's a new proxy called the CAP48, and it's also temperature dependent. And if you think doing clumped isotopes, if you've heard clumped isotopes are difficult, you should try doing CAP48 because it's even worse. You know, It's a real bear. I could use a stronger word, but I won't. But anyway, we've precipitated cal calcites in the lab. Those are the red dots. We measure the CAP47 values. That's the CAP or CAP47 calibration. And then I took the same samples and I measured the, the, the green dots are CAP48 samples. And because, you know, they had to go through a peer review, there were some people who didn't like, you know, like some things we did. I did it. This is the third iteration of this equation. All the equations were basically the same. The only difference was our whole uh, standardization procedure and how many standards we ran and everything like that. So we're pretty, pretty uh, happy that this is the actual correct line. And if you look at those data points, you, you plot CAP48 against CAP47, and the gray line is the theoretical line. They fall on that. The errors for 48 are larger because it's only four parts per million of the CO2 molecule. It's 10 times less than the 47. So it's much more and more difficult to measure. All right, so if we put the San Salvador dolomite on this plot, it falls there. Now, it falls a little bit off the line, maybe. There are about 20, 25 points in there underneath those horrible blue dots there. So they're all sitting on top of each other. If you look at the Clino data, the Clino data where we said, you know, there was all this non-equilibrium bacterial sulfate data, it's over there. So unequivocally, you know, the 48 data are telling us, you know, this is a non-equilibrium uh, situation here. We already know that sulfur isotopes are pretty well elevated because of, you know, it's a rally distillation in its closed system. So um, we have both CAP48, CAP sorry, and the sulfur isotopes there. And if we, we can apply one of these models here, we're still sort of working on this. Uh, actually, I have to apologize. This is a model from Weifu Gu. It's actually not the right, right reference there, but he, he wrote a paper in the Geochem Cosmochem Acta, which has a code which you can use. And you can, you can basically play around with different pH values and different uh, DIC values and get these sort of evolution patterns of how the clumped isotopes for 47 and 48. I should explain what this, this graph is, actually. I didn't do that. But equilibrium would be the zero point right in the middle. So if it's, uh, you know, the data for, cal for, for Clino, which are the red ones, are falling off to this side, which means they're too hot. Okay. And if it's over that side, it's too cold. And these, these little loops here uh, trace pathways which samples would follow if they were under these sort of conditions of different pH and different DIC values. So magnesium isotopes have also been suggested as, uh, uh, not, as indicators of bacterial sulfate reduction. And this is a, copy, this is a figure from our paper, uh, my student's paper, 2021 where we have all the Clino data and the UNDA and the San Salvador data. This is also the original data from the Higgins paper. And uh, so biogenic aragonite starts down here where the aragonite is and calcite starts up there. And during diagenesis, they would end up where the diagenic calcite is. And if we were sort of surprised that we really didn't see too much difference in the magnesium, uh, rel you know, whether it was you know, bacterial or not. And the final thing I want to show is if you take these data, and this was what was not in John's paper, uh, and, and you add the sedimentology to the data. Uh, and the sedimentology, from this case, comes from this great paper by Jeroen Kenter uh, and Bob Ginsberg, who would basically they describe the clinocore in, I would say, nauseating detail, but you know, very high detail. 
and he had all these surfaces which they identified, you know, erosional contact, reduced sedimentation rate, marine hard ground. And um, what I've done here with the smiley faces is that every time you see a, you know, hard ground, the calcium kicks up to more positive values. And that would be open system diagenesis because basically the open system recrystallization or dissolution precipitation reaction causes the calcium isotopes to get more positive. And the reverse happens for the magnesium. So in, if you take a core like this <clears throat> and you look at it, you can actually make sense of these little inflections here if you relate them to the original uh, sedimentology. And, you know, obviously there's some which they don't fit, and that could be either that the geochemistry is telling the truth and they didn't actually identify the you know, surface as correct, because some of them were a little subjective, you have to say. Uh, or, you know, we just didn't sample, we didn't sample them the core and that rate of detail, you know, so we could have, you know, basically missed them with the, with the, either the calcium or the magnesium. So I think basically in this case, you know, the, these calcium magnesium in the, uh, are actually recording things like, you know, sedimentation rate or increased um, open and closed system. All right, so the end of this is that we think basically some of the dolomite, I shouldn't say all the dolomite, because I think maybe an Unda is like maybe slightly different than San Salvador, uh, but do, uh, that may be actually at least initiated by um, shallow reflux from shallow hypercyanine po uh, pools, ponds. It doesn't mean that the incline, all of the whole dolomite was formed by that process, but it could have been started by that process. And that um, these percolate downwards and they elevate leaving an elevated temperature signal in the um, closest to the ponds. And we can read the rest. But the, the main thing is that, you know, the, we do see signals of bacterial sulfate reduction in the carbonate associated sulfate and the cap 48 values and perhaps the cap 47 values, but they're actually closer to equilibrium than the cap 48 values. I have a whole bunch of extras there, but I'm going to save you. Thank you, Peter. Does anybody have a question? We're over time, but at this point, you're here at your own demise. <laughs> uh, there must have been poor water geochemistry then. Poor water from what? From the drill holes. From Kleina? Yeah. Or... Uh, well, there, there was no, uh, you know, it was open for drilling, so there was no drilling, you know, and, and basically we did try to use packers, but uh, the, uh, when we stopped the drilling, it, it drew water into the hole and it caused the thing to jam. And so actually after do, having, being jammed and having to blow the pipe off, they wouldn't let me do that anymore. But we actually did at the end of the core drilling uh, do, um, you know, do a baler, and I used tritium to, to, to correct the water for the contamination. So we do have high, you know, really what that showed was that, you know, there was high concentrations of calcium and magnesium down the hole. Um, it was, there was a heavy contamination. It wasn't ideal, so we didn't have anything else. Yes. It was up to, up to 50%, actually, maybe it was a little bit misleading below the, those surfaces, up, up to 50% below the surfaces, and then it decreased. So the model of dolomitization is there that during the hiatus, you know, there's sulfate and magnesium. So magnesium for the dolomitization and sulfate to oxidize organic material diffused from that surface downwards into the sediment. And then as, you know, it just got less and less effective as you went further down, therefore, you know, it was closer uh, higher near the surface. But even during that whole period, there were also these little surfaces which represented, you know, maybe shorter durations of interruptions, and you could sort of see increases in dolomite immediately associated with those, you know, so, yeah. You know. and, and we, I think we... No, 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 in that case, it's not, no. But you have to, one thing you have to realize that a lot of times, 
this also happened in the San Salvador is that people think, oh, it's dolomite, it's created more porosity, more permeability. But what you do is you, if you partially dolomitize something and then you leach it later, you create something which is really permeable and porous. You know? and so I think some of this, you know, there was a lot of uh, original speculation that when you, you know, dolomite, dolomitize two moles of calcium carbonate, you know, you get, you know, you produce one mole of, uh, so, you know, 200 grams of calcium carbonate, you get 186, and then the porosity difference is a net, you know, increase in, in, in porosity, sorry, when you do that. But in actual fact, probably the real reason is that when you partially dolomitize something, you create something which is more resistant to a later diagenetic fluid. That later diagenetic fluid comes through and, and basically removes all the um, you know, it's soluble stuff like calcite and what any any other aragonite that's left, and then you end up with this dolomite, which has amazing porosity in it and permeability. All right, thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.